Audio Frontier. This is Football Daft with Stephen Purden. Midfield Dynamo and average actor. Chris Toll. Target man. Suspicious character. And... Welcome to Football Daft, the daftest Scottish football podcast around. It's 8 o'clock in the morning and I'm really rough and I'm Stephen Purden. Let's welcome the team. First, a man who this week says he will be like a dog with two cocks if Larson returns to Celtic as a coach and he's eating a nice lolly at 8 in the morning. It's Chris Toll. What is happening? Why are you eating a nice lolly at 8 in the morning? Because I've been up with my new puppy since 4 o'clock this morning. And it's now afternoon time for me, really. Mm, fair enough. I'm talking He's a cracker, about dogs. Mate. This man's dog has been walking around with a hard on for the last 10 days. That's right. How's your dog, mate? Well, I've still no wanked it off yet, if that's what you're looking at. <laughs> but I think that's what my dad's wanting. You need to that? Well, I don't know. I asked my father that. He, he texts me saying, your pair dog has been ro- walking about with Anne hard on for the last 10 Anne. days. <laughs> And I'm hard on, and hard on, <laughs> because <laughs> his other dog Genie's on the break, man, and it's a big, it's, it's a big retriever, and we Cooper's on a wee, it's the same as yours, too, same dog as you, Laz Zap, so, Aye. so, fuck, Can man, it's want... wee lipstick's been up for fucking 10 days, man, I was like, to my dad, we want me day wank it half or what? Yeah, see, see when a dog's got that, going on, mm-hmm. now, like, if we got up in the morning or something, or you've got one yourself, <laughs> does the dog right. walk funny? <laughs> 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 it likes to fucking grab a hood of your leg and all that and but it's a leg, try to your right leg. It's not like us, man. You can just slip in to tap your boxers and pull your t-shirt down, man. It's not like a dog kind of day. It just stoats a bit. I, 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 need, I need to slip it into my collar. <laughs> <laughs> he don't need to shove his up his snip. <laughs> By the way, I'm not even in, and I'm not in the mood for talking about football today, man. I don't know fuck all what's happened this week. Absolutely. Well, this week, this well, you just can tell me. Recon- reconstruction is looking oh, like oh, I know. Oh, it's right for a shite reconstruction. I know. My head needs reconstruction this morning. <laughs> but it's not going to be happening. The whole fucking, I mean, Anne Budge, how, how she's proposing, it's not going to go down well, isn't it, not at all? Uh, no, but was that Gregor's dad talking there? Is her name actually Abudge? Abudge. <laughs> Ah, budge. I'm here with budge. Anne Budge. <laughs> Anne, anyway, your dog on. has Anne hard on. <laughs> <laughs> what about, what, honest to God, man, she's pissing into the wind, isn't she? Aye, aye. It's not going to happen, but you ain't Graham. Aye. Doesn't care, don't you? Don't fuck me. No, no else to put it. Yeah, another big thought for you. I do, week, do but, right. right, this week, but, right, what about Livingston on Twitter? Oh, aye, bro. What was that all about? What the fucking work that was? Uh, <laughs> that was a Do you know what? It was good. It was good publicity it, because uh, the amount of coverage it got throughout football, not uh, just Scottish football. Do you know what I mean? Like, all the big football sites picked it up and all that. Like, uh, like your lad Bible and all that. They all picked it up. Is and people will be looking and following Livingston now. Do you know what I mean? CNN, no, they really they'll Iceland. forget about it next week. Do you know what I mean? But I bet they'll be doing it now. Aye. It's, <laughs> it's the wee 15 minutes, man. It's the wee 15 Aye, let them have their fun. Let them have their fun. Let them have it. The wee Tony Macaroni Arena with the tourists and the tourists. By the way, that that it's just a, another thing that got announced pretty early this morning or late last night. Um, the English Premiership's got a starting date. Oh, yeah. Sorry, Mate, sorry. I was looking at Sky Sports News with one eye last night, Hoff Cup, when I came in. Mate, there's going to be football on every single day, more or less. Did you really? see the schedule? Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Did you see it last night? The schedule's going to be insane to get this league. So, so what's going to happen then if the fucking Champions League restarts? Ah, it's not going to restart. Well, this they're going. The, I don't think that will restart by the time England fixtures <sighs> done. Do you? Nah. Nah. So they're nah. going to complete the Champions League then, aye? Well, they're still taught. They've no confirmed then, but they're still. Did they not say September or something for that? The Rangers return game me back. But then how can they do that though? Because what the the Champions League will have started for the next season. Say whoever wins the Europa League, 
doesn't qualify for the Champions League through their league, how can they then be added into the Champions League through the Europa League when the fucking two competitions are set are, are playing in the same season in different seasons? How do you do it? Well, it's as, it's as fucked up as fucking completing the Scottish Cup when teams right. are going to have a fucking clear out of players and then they sign new players and then they go to play the fucking semi-finals of the Scottish Cup. They don't talk of Stephen Whitaker leaving Hibs. Are they? Aye, there's talk of that. So what's going to happen when they go to play the semi-finals of the Scottish Cup and you've got different players? Do you know what I mean? Okay, it's, it's a fucking... It's, the whole thing's an omni shambles, mate. And what about... Yanis Hadji signing, you heard about that, Gredo, do you know that? He signed for it, you know that? Yeah, he's getting his bags packed for that, so the room, man. Well, <laughs> <laughs> Gredo, no, this is, no, I get told, in fact, no, I'll keep that for the room, no, sorry. Right, I'll keep okay. that one for the room, no, all right. What <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, so... about the other big news and all? Mad Harry Redknapp. Oh, hey, hey. We play a lot of charity matches on a yearly basis at LJ. I can't wait to meet Harry Redknapp. I know Canada. that's... I'm glad it's here today. Right. And talking about all these stories that's happening in Scottish football, this takes me on to my favourite party football daft these days. Chrissy's Rumour Mill. What's happening? Right. I've got two of them. Wow. Right. You've got two of these. I'm on the edge of my seat, mate. So mad, right. man. Now, Yanis Hadji, you like, well, that's your, might not be happening. However, mm. however, I've been told by my, my mole <laughs> that Yann uh, Genk have asked Rangers to pay the Yann, uh, the, some of the fee directly to Celtic for a boy Kouassi. How fucking funny is that? So, right. So, so, so Genk want a boy. What's his name? Genk have signed a boy Kouassi off of Celtic. Right. Paid for him yet. So because they want Yanis Hadji money. money for Kwasi to Selic. Mm-hmm. <laughs> saves them £25 in international payment fees. <laughs> right. are, you, are you sure it's no Rangers that's requested that then? <laughs> okay, no, man. Right, the other one is <laughs> actually getting back we were talking about Harry Redknapp see about a month before lockdown I was in a wee uh, restaurant in Airdrie and you know who was in it now this might just be a coincidence but they were both on I'm a Celebrity Get Me Out of Here with Harry Redknapp and it was uh, Emily Atak for the in between us and your man for Torchwood which what's his name again John Barrowman John Barrowman aye in an Airdrie restaurant how the fuck did we do there? Well, they must have been up there Adrian talks with Harry Redknapp trying to buy the club. What is Emily? Well, a- is she going to be the club physio? <laughs> I can I can see the connection with Emily Atak, but what's John and Barman going to do? John Barman. John Barman's the one. Oh, was John, oh right, was John Barman on that? I am Harry's mate. When I'm a celebrity. I. He sent me to a theatre, fucking. Check it out. Is John and Emily been up on a scouting mission? <laughs> <laughs> so Harry Redknapp is the owner of Airdrie Football Club. Emily Atax, the club physio, and John Barrowman's the first team coach. <laughs> John John Barrowman's the first time entertainment. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's fucking hilarious! Did that actually happen, Chris? I. <laughs> Aye, mate, I would that. It's the rumour mill, isn't it? <laughs> You're talking shit, aren't you? <laughs> I was sitting there going, fucking hell, what were they doing in the Fuck me, man. I mean, I can understand Emily Atak, but why is John and Barrowman there? <laughs> <laughs> why is John and Michael Barrymore there? <laughs> <laughs> <You> fucking... <laughs> I can't understand. <laughs> oh, for fuck's sake. Oh, I like this bit of the show, man. Fucking oh, hell. So... <laughs> Mate, that's a, that's a bit of a scoop, but that's a bit of a scoop. Oh, no, no. It's just that, I'll be honest with you, I might be putting two and two the gallon and getting five, but what's the chances of John Barrowman and Emily Atak being in a Witherspoons in Erdry? You know and, I mean? and then a month later, Harry Redknapp is... Unveiled. ...to be taking over Erdry. 
So this week on the show, we have Scottish football legend Owen Coyle, and also it is Chris Toll's turn on the Legends Lottery. I'm looking forward to that today. What do you think? Huh? I think it's got to be I good. Know, right, eh? I mean, right. is anybody's birthday coming up? Oh, is anybody's right. birthday coming up? It's mine. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. We'll see what birthday Santa brings you, Grado. When's your birthday? In the uh, next Tuesday. It's my birthday tomorrow. That <laughs> is. Seriously. Uh, it's so it's because you're only a couple of days before me. <laughs> what did you know? See, when I was like, oh, we're going to get Jerry Pony for your birthday next week. What did you know? Say it for? I thought you were after me. Oh, you know him before you. No, oh, fuck. So you up there? Yeah, sorry, big hang, a big surprise for Grado's birthday. Then it's my birthday tomorrow, and it's just getting totally fucking kiboshed. Listen, I will send you a fruit basket. <laughs> nah, I'm sorry. <laughs> Shove your fruit basket where the sun don't shine, man. Right. Who would you have wanted? Who would you have wanted? You's... I did tell you about two weeks ago. Are you just on the coast? I thought you said your birthday was after his. So did I. I'm no. sure you did. No, that, mate, you know my birthday's before yours. No, I know, I know, I know. I just totally fucking forgot. I feel terrible that's, now. That's bad, I'm sorry, you... Stevie. If I, think, if I think he's okay. got... Who I think he's of. You like you like that table, aren't you, Bob? I I'll, I'll take it as a wee birthday present, and I will accept <laughs> like the basket as well. And remember, if you have any banter for us, please go on the Twitter at Football Daft Podcast. <laughs> <laughs> he's on a donut. Football Daft Podcast on Instagram, and just search for Football Daft on Facebook. Thanks, we'll guys. We we'll broke Stevie. <laughs> Alright, so everybody's new favourite part of the show coming up. Yep. Uh, we've got our brother for another mother, the G4 Claims legend that is Jim Muir. Jim, take it away. Welcome, Jim. Welcome, Jim. Welcome, Thank Jim. Thank you very much. I'm a bit more relieved after yesterday because I didn't know if you Nick was going to get back to work, so I'll shake myself a bit. <laughs> don't want that happening. No, nah, mate, fuck Anyway, we get on to our business stuff then. <laughs> right guys, if you're involved in a road traffic accident and you're not at fault, G4 Claims can make it easy for you. They can provide you with a complete accident management support you require. They will recover the cost from the third party at fault third party. Sort out a like for like vehicle replacement. They also organise your vehicle to be repaired at one of their approved body shops and return to you should your vehicle be deemed a write off. They will recover the pre-accident value for your car and write you a big fat check for it. And the best of all, it won't cost you a penny as they charge it to the at fault insurance. G4 claims don't cold call. They don't buy data and once the process of claim, your insurance will remain unscathed. And the best thing is the co and the team over there, they will take care of your case and don't think they can help. They, will, they, they won't take your case on. So if you're been involved in a road traffic accident or know someone that has, get on to G4 claims at 01698 767 172. Get in. Get get them at notifault.com or find out the uh, social media at G4 Claims Limited. Thank you very much. Hey. Jim, you forgot to do the tagline again. I know. What is his tagline? G4 Claims, what is it? It's, it's Grado's tagline. <laughs> no, you, right, everybody do it. G4 Claims. G4 Claims. G4 Claims. Very easy. <laughs> <laughs> Football Dafts. Big question. Now this week we're asking if you've ever had any embarrassing encounters with a football player. The question was set by none other than Chris. Apparently he's got a belter. Shoot. So I've actually got two. My, my most embarrassing one was I met I, I went to Tomboy's testimonial dinner, right? And I went in the toilet and there was an there in the toilet. And then when I came out of the, the cubicle, Henry Larson was standing doing a fish, right? And I had just done a fish. Mm. And he, he, turn, <laughs> he turns around and he goes to wash his hands. And I've not washed my hands yet. And I fucking grabbed his hand to shake his hand. And I had a woolly on. <laughs> push on you? No, I didn't have push on me, but I had woolly on. I had and been touching you, my woolly and I had not washed my hands yet. Did you just did grab his horn or not? I, I can I I get pure excited. I'm not gonna lie, I get pure excited as fuck, man. I obviously and I went like oh Henry Larson and I just like done that kind of thing. And he kinda he was he was alright, 
and then I went, oh, I'm sorry, I, I fucking I better wash my hands, and he's like, I, I, too I think late. You better. Right, so here's the best part. So later on, right, I've went to the hang, I've went to the bar and like sitting with Simon Donnelly and all of that, and all the players, and then we. Uh, Larson comes over and he's fucking obliterated steaming steamboats, man. Right? And he just wouldn't talk to me. He just, he went, I was sitting in his company and he went, I was asking him things, he wouldn't talk to me. Right? And do you know how they say, never meet your heroes? Heroes. Genuinely, yeah. I believed that. When I, after I met Henry Larson, I was like, he's a fucking arsehole. But then I met hey, him again later on, he was all right. Hey, you, you done a piss, had your horn on your corner. Oh, man, I know, oh, but bear in mind, I'm steaming an all, Stevie. Well, I mean, so you know what you like, you're... you're, you're you know, you prepare yourself for us, you were at fucking Tomboy's Testimonial. But see, I, I was at Tomboy's Testimonial dinner, right? But I didn't realise it, it was very... Well, the good ones were going to go. <laughs> no, I, I knew that they would all be... <laughs> <laughs> Do you know, there, there was only two of them that were bit kids that night, and one of them was saying the glass and threw my own fault, but the other one was Mark Boxel. He was just a fucking fanny, full stop. How? Uh, Why about that? What? No, he was just I, a dick. Do you hear that? He's on Twitter and all that, as you know. Well, that, uh, well, do you know what? If he's on Twitter and he hears it, he can fucking apologise, can't he? Right? <laughs> <laughs> Who's he been a dick to you? Was he teasing no, you? I just, what? No, I was like, teasing you? When we were leaving, it, no, he wasn't teasing me or anything like that. He was just like, he was dead ignorant. Do you know what the way you are when you meet fans? <laughs> uh, oh, Toe. Toe, that. see, Toe. Did you want to take a jaw clean off him? I went right off of me. <laughs> I, went, I, went, I, went, I went into the I went in back into the ballroom and I seen Mark Lanier. I went like oh, Mark Boxel's an arsehole. He was fucking stealth the next day. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, no, major, major shareholder and bust up with player man. The other the other one is just because I want to tell it because I know my mate gets really, really fucking embarrassed about this story, right? right. So we are we're all outside China Whites in, in Glasgow, right? And, and well, we, we, I remember Oscar? China Whites, it was, it, was, it was years ago, it was called China Whites. Oh, well, I remember China Whites, but where, where about was it? In Glasgow. Why is he going to American, man? Glasgow. No, I, I didn't say Glasgow. Yes. But see, I was thinking, maybe folk for Glasgow say Glasgow days. Do you yeah, say no, Glasgow? Folk for corporate, say Glasgow. It's Glasgow. Oh, I say Glasgow. Um, Glasgow. Uh, I, you, ever, you ever been to a cemetery up in Glasgow? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going man half an hour, bye. <laughs> so, uh, we're outside, and you remember it was like quite fucking, it was quite like uh, fancy and all that. Right? <coughs> it was so, a trendy place to be. Me and all my mates were standing outside trying to get in like, a bunch of fucking marks, you know what I mean? <laughs> the next thing, Stillian Petrov walks out, and I'm like, fucking hell, Stillian Petrov, cool. I went up and just went like, how are you doing, Stillian? Please to make you shake his hand and all that. My mate was pure nervous as fuck, nervous as fuck, right? So we get turned away from the club anyway, because I was in my 12 years. And we're walking away and my mate says, I've got to take this chance to go and meet Stilly and Petrov. And they ran up to him and he, he went like that. Thanks for all the Celtic stuff you've done. <laughs> 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 and he didn't introduce his cellar and like that, didn't say, pleased to meet you. Just went up and went, thanks for all the Celtic stuff you've done, what I've done. Is that maybe fucking Jesus or something like that? What I mean, Celtic stuff you've done? I know, and my mate's name's Alan Curry, and he what? I, I think he listens to this or watches it, and he and Frank and him will be cussing myself like this because they remember it. Man. Thanks for all the Celtic stuff you've done. <laughs> <laughs> I've every boy, you know what I mean? He's a belter. <laughs> what about you? Who's getting belters? No, really, no, like the one recently when I met Walter Smith was a bit embarrassing. We were in in the director's box, me and my brother-in-law, and talking to Walter, an old, old Ethel, aye. aye. She loves you, but... Aye. Me and Ethel, director's box. Is Ethel Walter's wife? Aye, aye. she's brand new. Big, who big was the, who was the tea woman? Who was Lynn? the tea woman? Lynn. Remember the, the tea woman that chopped the, chopped the cup at Graham, no, Graham soon as chopped the cup, and she went Was that not a St. Johnson... T T woman. No, it was the, 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 the Rangers, the wee Rangers T woman. Uh, I can't. It doesn't matter. It's no Ethel anyway. But I always get. Oh, no, Ethel's up. Sir Walter's wife, man. But we're standing there, and it's not really that bad. It's just you, you know what it's like, Gredo. You talk to Walter. You get too excited and all that. Aye. All I can see is nine in a row. The second eight time he was back, winning all sorts of trophies. You want to be all composed as if you're cool. But it had to be buffy hang on. 
so my brother in law, me and him and Air and Walter and that was there, and they had like a uh, Indian curry. So I'm picking up the curry and I'm eating it. And you know, it's like you stand there and you hold your plate and you're talking, Walter's there, and Aye. you're talking. Instead of picking up the pita bread to go with the curry, I pure daft, stupid hang man. I picked up the poppadon, right? So I'm stoning and I'm putting the poppadon on the curry, but the poppadon's going all soggy and it's breaking and all the crumbs are going on the flare. <laughs> but I'm stoning and I'm talking to Walter and under my feet, all I can see is this big mountain of crumbs at my, at my shoe. <laughs> <laughs> and in my head, Walter's going, what is this? How can this wee guy not just eat his dinner, man? And I'm like, I know, Walter, and it's all fucking going down my suit and all that. And even Dan, my brother, was looking at me as if, what are you doing, man? There's crumbs around the carpet. How can this wee guy not just eat his dinner? <laughs> See, actually, when I think about it, I did do something embarrassing. I think it was late last year with Walter and all, and it was today with Ethel. I was standing at right at the sea, the, the, just at the bottom of the marble staircase at Ibrooks, and Walter had obviously been in the left one side, maybe talking to the players or whatever he was doing. And he was with his grandwains and all that. And uh, we, as, as he came out the door, I was like, how you doing, Walter? He's like, how you doing? And he walked away and he was going out. And I, I just, I don't know why I thought it would be a good thing to say, right? But I was just like, I was being deadly serious, right? I went, tell F what I was asking for her. And every, the whole room just started laughing and he just turned around and looked at him as if to say, what did you just say? <laughs> I've, been, I've generally been nice. I generally was like, tell you what I was asking for her. And everybody just buckled and all that. And he got fucking, what? What would you say? See you later. Um, I bet you went to the ground to swallow you, mate. All right. I thought I was being, I thought, I thought, it, was, I thought it was going to go, well, do a big man, see you later. <laughs> it just kind of went, just fucking stood and stood, stared me out and every cunt laughed. Maybe they're finished. finished. What? Maybe they're finished. Well, I'm not <laughs> <laughs> That's fucking funny. Well, but it's one. I know what you're talking about, but because we're talking about the game, and I think Hibs were beating us one 0 Then at half time, we're talking, and I'm talking about formations and all that. And then I'm like, why am I talking about <laughs> formations? <laughs> and he's, uh-huh. I, was about, I was about ten seconds past, and that, that's not that long a time. But when he's standing there, like, it feels like ten hours. <laughs> and I'm like, I maybe we should go with the two up front, man. I mean, that's four three three is not happening. What do you think, Walter? <laughs> Wait, I fucking drop the popper dom oh, yeah, I mean he's done and staring at me like it's a free man. Don't talk Aye. to me about formations, not but do right? you think Walter do you think do you think my opinion's good, Walter? <laughs> 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 Walter's like, Aye, Walter? I know a bit fat, but Yeah, I thought I'm asking for it. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, right. I, mean, but I, I don't think we should play the 4 3 3, would you hang everywhere? <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's funny. Let's see what the listeners think. Let's see what the listeners are doing. <laughs> yeah. Laura McCrimmon bumped into Aaron Hutton outside the players' lounge when I was at Rangers Hospitality as we were getting took a tour of the trophy room. I was a few wines into the day and happily shouted to him, I'm a Hutton. My husband was mortified as I blabbed on about my maiden name being Hutton, and I was now a McCrimmon. <laughs> there we go, guys. <laughs> Martin Fox says, I was in the queue to our chaos in 1996 behind Barry Ferguson. He was acting the big I am with all his pals. Went to walk in and he counted it on the stairs. He got up quickly and he went down. Great night. I kill There's no meant to be embarrassing. We're not looking for embarrassing stories for the fans. No embarrassing the players. Aye. <laughs> see, see, just even, see, just even it up. I seen Scott McDonald falling for the top stair to the bottom stair and blanket one night. Pushed, it, pushed out his arse, man. It was amazing. I, I remember, and uh, what'd you call that place? They'll go to fucking the Cranfin, man. Mate, this yeah. is before I was on the telly and that. Uh, fucking, I met. Alan McGregor in the staircase. Now I was, I started going, Alan McGregor, shags ten birds and I. <laughs> and he went, and he went, he stopped and went, fifteen mate. He fucked off, <laughs> <he's> brilliant. <laughs> right, Steve Anderson. He says, met the Falk Cup team out in Stirling. Oh, that's a big one. And Yogi's final year as a manager and signed all the old timers looking for a payday. I apparently mentioned to Jackie McNamara at a bar in Pivo. Think it's called Corn Exchange now. That, that one's a fifer. <laughs> <laughs> and then the boy went home to his mum. <laughs> the cat sat on the mat. Fuck me, man. 
I apparently mentioned to Jackie McNamara at Bar and Pivo. I think it was called. I think it's called the Comic Exchange now. That once a fifer, always a fifer. <laughs> Can't mind. Had a few shandies, but a reminder in the morning from my mate. Fast, well embarrassing, man. <laughs> I'm embarrassed for this fucking uh, and this fucking suggestion. This hey, what? <laughs> what do you say? What do you hey, call it when folk write in? Jeff, you're I, that blind that you should <laughs> put your glasses on because you can't see two feet in front of yourself. <laughs> you must have been all steamed up. Right. Right, Connor Rowley, one of my first nights working at a hotel, Barry Ferguson was part owner in Rangers Legends dinner was on and I'm walking past the man himself with dirty dishes to take back to the kitchen and he has put his hand up to get the attention of another waiter and he's done it, he clipped me in the balls and never even dropped a plate, he apologised and I was just over the moon he spoke to me. Also Bob Malcolm used to love a really good swally in said hotel. <laughs> Scott... <laughs> It's got my how are these embarrassing? I want I'm, folk getting up and trying to get off with fucking I, Steve I, Archibald. <laughs> know what I mean? Uh, so Scott <laughs> Ma was standing with my mate at the portal, he's outside Ibrox waiting and his son coming out. The four walks past. I get that excited, I dropped my half bottle of tonic that I had up my juke and it smashed. The four shot his cell, but he still stood for still stayed for four weeks. That's decent, that's decent. That's a good one. That's the only shot that he jumped in the four. It was if that's been made up. Stuart McEwen, playing at Cohen in Sports Club and Ali McCoyce was in the next changing room. My brother walks in and says to him, all right, Ali, I thought you were a good-looking cunt. He was buckled. <laughs> <Sky good. laughs> the Legends Lottery on Football Daft. Right, Troops, it's that time of the show, the Legends Lottery. On Football Daft, we make it our mission to find out where the cult heroes are. Each week, one of the team is tasked with the mission of finding a former club legend. And this week, it's Grado's birthday. Happy so, birthday well, to me. Well, next week it's Grado's birthday, so my birthday tomorrow, but Paul's got a wee present for Grado this week. I have got a wee present for Gredo. I'm just finalising it right now. Um, is, just this, sending, is, just this sending, all, is this all just like a big double bluff where it's going to be like some for my birthday because my birthday is the morning? No. Right. Happy right. birthday. So, ladies and gentlemen, after, what, 16 episodes? 16, 16 episodes are we on? Something like that. Oh, there's, right. been, there's been mail that, mate. I and all of it, the good ones. <laughs> anyway, uh, so about 16 episodes, <laughs> every single episode, if I sat my arse down on the chair in that studio, I've been introduced to this mythical fucking creature in Scottish junior football. The legend. The yeah, legend. The answer. man. The myth. The legend. I've got fucking goosebumps, I'm not even going to get on. Please welcome to Football Daft, the one and only, Mr. Jerry Pauline. Jerry is great though. <laughs> yeah, that's a- Jerry, keys a go. Doing, Jerry, Jerry, keys a go. <laughs> Jerry, keys a go. <laughs> fucking, I have no chance that bit, man. Get in oh, there. Bit How's it going? Hi. No I, just, I I've noticed that bit of you fucking man. It's so good to see you. I'm actually shit myself here, Jerry boy. <laughs> How many goals did you score for the Buffs? I uh, right between two and a half to three hundred. You were the bit, honestly, you are my favourite player. You... That's no bad. That's no bad for a centre half, Jerry. I ah, will. <laughs> I used to play in the middle of the park. Oh, what? Jerry, you have no idea how much a legend you are on this show, man. Honestly, Aye. every week you your name comes up in this show. Red <laughs> is your biggest fan in the world, And see the best it is, and all right, I've got I've got a mate called Dean Fraser, right? And years ago, we, we met in Morrison's, and I went, remember Jerry Pliny, man? Because we used to go to Buffs games together. I was like, yeah. let's have a competition. First one to get Jerry Pliny. Now, we searched Facebook for years to try and get a hoodie and never go to you. Now, look, I've got you right here. It's amazing. <laughs> Do you know what threw me? It was a Gerald Pliny on Facebook. We were all well, typing that's... in Jerry, trying to get right. you. Right. Is that just to stop all your fans? Ah, well, you? well, there's a fan base out there, isn't there? There definitely <laughs> is. How was, how was the 20 year anniversary? Uh, we won an OVD Scottish Junior Cup last year. Uh, we went to the anniversary on uh, Saturday night, and it was a great night. And, uh, supporters organised it. 
and it was a fantastic night. Aye. And all the boys turned out, so they did. did, did, did was, uh, who was all there? Rusty Hartness? Everybody was there. Everybody. Was Stevie Farrell there? Tom Curry? Farrell, everybody was there. Do we bit David uh, Sharkey? I bet he wasn't there. No, we Sharkey never turned up. Did he know? No, young Sharkey never turned up. For fuck's sake, man. But see, right. um... Say it was like a wee boy in a sweetie shop. <laughs> Anyway, thank fucking never met him in a toilet. <laughs> 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 anyway, I mean, no, I yes. remember like yesterday, I had two guys coming out to my house, giving us a quote for my slabs, and they turned around and were like, ah, my gaffer. Any plane in the show yet? And I was like, a big tall guy with a big long beard. He's like, he ah. works with us. Ah, uh, John. Aye. John and Brian. Aye, you're everywhere, uh, mate. Everywhere. I hope, I hope you gave him a job. I've not got the quote yet. I've got to get back to you. <laughs> so, Jerry, just tell me what it's like being playing for the Buffs every weekend. Do you, do you obviously, did you travel down for Glasgow every week to play for the Buffs? I, I travel with Glasgow. At the start there, 89, I think I went to the Buffs. 89, 90, I went to the Buffs. And uh, I used to travel with guys like Alan Archibald, which you had on your show. That's right. Uh, Jimmy Craney. Aye, that's right. Mark Cameron. So there was always, mm-hmm. there, there was always a lift for me. To get what, about me Mark, Abbey Park. what about Mark Cameron Shies? He was great at throwing the ball in, wasn't he? He was one of the longest throws I've ever seen. Aye. <laughs> I think it was the a few times at Coat Your Heat, done it? <laughs> That's over <laughs> me here. <laughs> <laughs> so, can you tell what, what was your, your, your favourite experience of playing above all the years? Was it the OVD Scottish Junior Cup final, which I ran a bus oh. to fucking eight year old, ten year old? I would say that was the Holy Grail. Eh? That's what you play from the, the junior game. And uh, what the club done that year was something else. I don't think it'll ever be repeated in junior football. So tell them. I mean, what was the schedule like? Some games we were playing on a Sunday, then maybe a Tuesday, a Thursday. I remember one week we must have played about four games in the one week. Did we know? We won every one of them. I think we played three games in the one week. We played the the Monday, the Wednesday, and Friday. Aye. So it was a Saturday, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Aye, and I think I the Friday night was the West, the West, Friday night was the West of Scotland Cup That's final. right, that's right. Uh, Pollock's Park. So mm-hmm. uh, it was a great occasion. Aye. So it was, we won, how many trophies did we win that year? I think we won eight, did we know? We won six. six. I don't know about the other two. <laughs> <laughs> I just got my head. I mean, that, you, you were an absolute hero in Cowan, and I bet you must have got your whole neighbour in Cowan. <laughs> did you know? <laughs> I get on it, dude. <laughs> <laughs> He's got the key to winning. <laughs> <laughs> you do, you do. Do you sometimes come back for games now, Jenny? I still get down to Abbey Park. Aye. I still get down to the... I've not been into the new ground yet, but tell me it's some set up down there, eh? Aye. I mean, my father, as I say, my father, um, he followed the bus for as a boy, and he was always fighting with Jim McSherry and uh, fucking... Oh, aye, and he was always... Um, he, he wasn't behind this new park. But we actually went right. to last year because there was a lot of folk weren't happy about the Buffs Park moving to Abbey Park. <laughs> but the actual setup is brilliant, and it? it's, uh, it's 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 got all the mod cons. Do you know what I mean? It's got a really good place you can go for a wee drink, so it's looking good. You need to come down. It's looking really good. Mm-hmm. I'll be doing this season at some time once Aye. this is all over and by way. Aye. And Aye. Uh, I think a couple of boys have asked me doing Stuart McCune and that to support us. So uh, it'd be good to get down and see them this season. It's a Aye. new Aye. challenge for me. Jerry, yes. say to him if Gregor can do the, the half time draw. <laughs> Take him on the park. <laughs> hey, hey. Well, I might not be any panic this year, just get Gregor a job as a mascot. <laughs> Aye, I always wanted oh, to be a mascot when I was young enough to. There's no guy, there's no guy in the outfit big enough. <laughs> <laughs> oh, bro. So, Jerry, what was it? Gregor always plays this famous goal that you scored. Right, and it was in the oh, cup that, final, I think. Aye, there was that money, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, do you ever remember, Jerry, do you ever remember a supporter called Moose? At Buffs Park Moose. North? Aye, and he aye, always... He the railway line. That's right. And aye, remember, some, the some of these games, we were rattling teams 7, 8, nothing. And you'd always see if we scored the 7th goal, you would go, we don't want 7, we want 8. <laughs> then we would score 8, he would go, we don't want 8, we want 9. Did you remember him always shouting that for the side I of the remember, park? I remember Moose very well. So he did. I think he passed away, big Moose. Ah, he did. He did die. That's right. That's he right. Sad, sad that. Sad that. 
I'm not going to take man. Pedro this happy, my life. <laughs> no, no, but it's good. I wish my feather. I should have got my feather here. I know, man. I know, <laughs> 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 oh, oh, kid. So just just before you go, right? Tell me, tell me your your best. Mate, apart for the the cup final, just tell me a wee buff story. Tell me a wee buff story. A buff story. Mm -hmm. I remember the night we were playing at Abbey Park. Right? There was a Saturday we were playing at Abbey Park. And make sure he was the manager. Right. And me, Jimmy, he was a great guy, mm -hmm. fantastic manager. And I remember John Kay walking into the dressing room. And me, make sure he was trying to bring a bit of stability to the club and a bit of professionalism. And John McKay walks in with a fist supper. <laughs> so he goes, the wee man went ballistic. He said, What's that you eating there? And he went, Fish and chips. He said, My last fucking fish and chips you eat at this club. Monday night, they put them up for sale. <laughs> 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 so, so that was the strength of me, Jim McSherry. Aye. Maybe they wanted to best with him, so Aye. I so always remember that one. <laughs> he was eating a first supper. <laughs> <laughs> well, him, and, him and my father were always getting into fucking fights at the side of the park, man. I was a front. I mean, I was only seven, eight year old. And my dad would fucking make sure of this, make sure of that, and make sure we go. You want to come into the vest room and say that to the boys, eh? You want to come into the vest room and say that to the boys? <laughs> I'm like, ah, calm down, calm down, calm down. <laughs> Fucking we a, we had a good team back then, eh? The oh my god. Yeah, um, Stevie Farrell, another great player. Aye, aye, aye. Aye, who about Stuart Robertson, the goalie? Big Robo. Mm -hmm. so, they were all great guys, great football players. Were you, were you, were you, a bunch of guys. were you still at the Buffs when Andy Walker signed for a day? Aye, signed for a day, yeah. Signed for aye. a day? So he did. Aye, I played, went to the winton that day. Went to the winton, that's right, that's right. That's went right. to the winton and he scored, did he know? I don't know if it scored, but he never kicked a ball, so I don't <laughs> think he scored that day. <laughs> I, was just, I was going to say, did you run him out of town? Ah, well, I think a few of them get run out of town. Eh? <laughs> 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 oh, right, Jerry, well, I'll need to go because I've got a few in, 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 in half an hour, but listen. All right, guys. Um, it's all right, it's cool. Um, but anyway, I'll just wrap it up better. Jerry, you've made my Thanks. fucking birthday Thanks, and you've Jedo. made my year. You made you from the sir. banks of the river Gala <laughs> to the streets of the old red <laughs> We are the buffs. We are the buffs. We are, we are, we are the buffs. <laughs> Cheers, buddy. Cheers, Jerry. Cheers, Jerry. Cheers, Jerry. Cheers, Jerry. Cheers, Cheers for my perfect score on the Legends lottery, Jerry. <laughs> yeah, <right. That's> a... <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks, cheers, cheers, guys. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. See you later on. That was brilliant. brilliant. Loved it. Cheers Loved later, it. guys. See you later. Bye bye. Brilliant. Cheers after. See you later. Thanks, guys. Yes. So, go, boys, guys. boys, boys, boys. What were they talking about? Boys. Is is McCoy still in that? But he's laughing at. You a kid, on you got a funeral, but you're going to get Ali on the phone. I just just stay there, right? And I'll be back, right? <laughs> That's great over there, I take it, eh? He's got a few, you know. I don't even know if he'll ever be back, because he just met Jerry Pellini. I think that's his football daft career done. That's it. So, boys, what if he's got planned for next week? Right, so next week's your birthday, then. Right. Is it no Grado's turn next week? Or no, Stevie, it's your turn. You've got to get Alan McCoy for yourself. Imagine I brought Super Ali on in the Legends Lottery. <laughs> that is going to be a five-star Legends Lottery. That's going to get five, isn't it? It's got it, isn't it? Unless we've got wankers. Aye, aye. Unless we've got wankers. <laughs> There's a few guys out there that might try and fucking bring you down to and get like all, the all the Talbot fans will be on. Aye. Oh, the bastards. <laughs> <laughs> I, by the way, am I, I think I might be a Buffs fan by proxy here. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? I don't know. I, I, I've got a wee bit of a soft spot for them because you're a big fucking idiot. <laughs> so far, mate. So far. I know. I don't know where it is. So, right. um, well, Grado's fucked the... off. He's seen Jerry Pellini. My turn next week. That's it. I'm going to enjoy That's my... it, man. That's I'm it. I'm going to enjoy my birthday tomorrow, guys. See? Now it's time for a Beer 52 teaser. For your chance to win a case of beer, all you have to do is answer the question that we put to you. Last week, we asked you to give us five of the top ten non-EU top goal scorers to score in the English Premier League. 
Right, there was too many tops in there, but I think you get the gist, troops. <laughs> Congratulations to Blair Mulgrew, who's this week's winner, Charlie's wee brother. <laughs> Maybe. Maybe, who knows? Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> And this week's question is five members of the oh, Scotland. Oh, you've got to give us the answers. You've got to give us the answers. Come on. I've got the answers, all right. So the answers, the top ten were, right, I'm going to be honest with you, John Seaman, it says top ten non-EU. Yeah. I went top ten non-European Union. I had Berbatov in my list. He's not in the list. He, he is. He's in the top 20, but he's not in the, he's not top, in the 10. top 10. Oh, is he not? I no. thought he was a score. Right, so the top ten are Sergio Aguero, obviously. Yeah. Um, Dwight York, Didier Drogba, Emmanuel Adebayo, Yakubu, Mark Viduka, Carlos Tevez, what about the last three? No. Sadio Mane, Luis Suarez, and Mohamed Salah. Oof. See, when you take into account that Salah's only been there three seasons. That's a big achievement, man. That is an achievement. No half. No half. Right, so this week's question is, five members of the Scotland Euro 96 squad went on to manage in England. Can you name them? I can't even really remember the 96 squad. Uh, I know one. In fact, I've just thought of one. We, we can't really give away the answers, can we? Oh, no, man, we can't. Yeah. Uh, Right, Ali, Ali McCoist wasn't one of them, and Andy Gorham wasn't one of them. That's all he's needed. <laughs> right, so um, you can enter by you can enter by commenting on the link on the Football Daft Facebook page, or tweet your answer to the at Football Daft Pod. Winners must be over eighteen and stay in the UK, and you can get free beer from Beer Fifty Two as well. It's a monthly subscription service for beer, which they source from some of the greatest small batch breweries around the world. The theme cases every month with previous themes, including Germany, South Africa, Korea, New Zealand, and more. All you need to do is go to beer52.com forward slash daft, and we can sort out free beers if you just cover the 4 95 for the postage. So just go to beer52.com forward slash daft, that's the words beer and the numbers 5 and 2.com to get your first case of eight beers for free. Let's welcome to the show a man who, as a player, scored over 250 goals for the likes of Airdrie, Bolton, Motherwell, Dundee United and Falkirk. As a manager, he's won the First Division and led Burnley into the Premiership through the playoffs. He now finds himself at Indian side Chennai, and I'll try and pronounce that. <laughs> Please welcome Owen Coyle. Thanks, man. Great to see you. Great looking forward to it. Great to see you. And by the way, Steve, I'm going to take issue there. I thought a great intro and thanks for that, but it was actually 297 goals. Because See, is... I know, but I'll tell you why it is, because I think what they do is they just count league goals in like, a Wikipedia. So, so, obviously, I love the Cups and all the competitions, so there's about another 50 of the Cups. Right. So, uh, but I, producer John's a bit nervous, I think, so he's just kind of, it's a wee typo for Producer John. He's gone all red uh, now, look at him. Oh no, wait, what's it's your typo? It's Stephen. <laughs> It's not that, right. it's it. John, John I had to stop John for tightening 2,750 goals. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wish he did. <laughs> that's, that's why I left it over 250 goals because I knew it when I counted your, uh, all your cup goals on because oh, you just put a barrel like over those. I like it, John. Thank you. Yeah, right. thanks. Uh, John, is there anything you want to say before we start the own? Oh, well, listen, I'd, I'm just going to both smoke up Owen's arse because Owen, for me, played in my favourite Falkirk. So I've been watching Falkirk for 30 odd years. Um, and Owen played my favourite Falkirk side. And it was him. It was the, the last season at Brockville. And it was Owen, it was Lee Miller, and it was Colin Samuel up front. And see, between the three of them, we just scored for fun. And what a team that was, Owen, I have to say. I mean, I've you had Andy it. Seaton, Haji, you had Stevie Thompson wailing in for goals, you know, very you know, Oh, what a team. Yeah, I've got to say to you that, uh, I mean, I played till I was nearly 40 because I just, just love football, best game in the world. But that season, and I was lucky, I played in a lot of good teams, but it was such a special season for everything. You're right, the last season at Brockville, everybody used to cane, like Broomfield when I played, they used to cane Brockville and Broomfield. But do you know what? They were brilliant stadiums for the fans, for the players, because they were, they were ours. And uh, so it was the last season. The year before, as you remember, Falkirk were nearly relegated. So, yeah. Paul Ian had come in, we were talking with Chizzy. I'd been his player coach at Airdrie. So, I came with him, and then Big Yogi came back as player coach. 
And uh, with Alan Ferguson in the goal, Kevin James centre back. Right. But the thing I loved is that like, an, old, an older player being a player coaching, I was 36, 37 at the time. Uh, Lee Miller, Colin Samuel, Mark Kerr, with Jamie McCrocken, uh, Andy Lott, with some really special young players as well. Young Andy Rogers, who was terrific, but he used to come off the bench because we had such a good forward line. Uh, and it was just a, a brilliant scene. You remember the cup game against Hearts? Oh. I mean, absolutely demolished Hearts. Oh, do, do you know what? I've got a horrible story about that, Owen. Uh, I didn't realise it was an all ticket game, right? So I turn up at Brockville, going, all right, boys, let's up for it in the pub before it a couple of years. Get down to the ground and they go, you want your ticket, aye? What? It was all ticket. I was like, you had to go and join. We had to sit back up in the pub and my brother had done the exact same and listened to it, listened from behind the wall down to Brockville, listened to all the goals rattling about for watching Jeff Stell and just going, fucking hell. I've so never listened to this game. Well, we could have sold double the tickets that day because it was just, but the atmosphere, I've got to say, in Brockville, all season, it was just, a, for me, it was a special place. I was really lucky because I came in as player, player coach, but then, as you know, me and Yogi took over. I think we were a point ahead. We ended up winning the league by nine points. But So you end up player, co-manager. I end up, I think, I was the top scorer in the division that year. I end up getting the player of the year at 37. It was just an incredible season. But the special thing for me, out with all that, was the atmosphere. The Falkirk fans were absolutely brilliant. And again, there's a lot of carry-on, as you know, just now, about the, the leagues and everything up the road. But if you remember, we were denied promotion. They wouldn't allow us right. into the Premier League because it says we didn't have a stadium. That's we were right. going to ground share with Airdrie. And the technicality was that if a game was postponed, because it was Airdrie Stadium, they would have the, uh, the first rights for a postponed game. And that's why they stopped Falkirk. It was, it was ridiculous what they'd done. But the actual, John's right, the actual football season, it was incredible. We're good, I would say, good senior pros, Marcel Yogi. Like Kevin James Allen, but the young players that were going to go on in brilliant careers, you know, Mark, Colin Samuel, Lee Miller, Lee's a gem, absolutely loved it. Still keep in touch with Lee, great to see him in big cracks doing well at Falkirk. And again, I know the league was shot early, but for me, Falkirk would have not even win the league. There was so little between them and Ray Throwers. So, uh, but no, thanks for that. It was a brilliant, brilliant season. No worries. That season, Owen, um, my mate was actually playing with Falkirk, uh, Philip Craney. Do you remember him? I do actually, he was a lovely young man, played at the uh, played at the bike, young lad, really nice lad, well spoken. And uh, played, played a few games, he was involved in the squad and all that. Aye, and it, just coming at the end of the season when he's won the league, he was involved with the squad quite a lot. And he got the bad injury. Remember he, he fell and he broke his arm and he never came back for it. And and see that's the thing is because and this is injuries are a terrible part of football for anybody, but particularly for young players like that, because I'll tell you how good he is. To force your way in, and John will tell you to force your way into that team. Aye. That tells you how, because I mean that was it. It was the best team in the first division by a mile. We could easily play played in the in the Premier League with that team easily. And for a young boy to break into that team, that tells you how much talent the ability had. And that's Aye. the sad one of the sad bits of the football when somebody's talent that gets an injury. And it, it, you know it's horrible because he was such a talented young player. I remember that well. We had a few young ones, McSween and boys like that, and. We were determined to give young players, because that's what I've always been for coaching, give young players an opportunity to try, because you never know how good they are until you play them. But he was one that was sure was a great career. Was that, a, was that a big part of when you were playing yeah. down in Burnley? Eh, sorry, when you were managing down in Burnley? Eh, was it a, like bringing through the young players? Was that a big part of how you managed to get the team to galvanise so well? And, you know, the last season I was that. I took a day off work to watch the playoff final, and me and my mate were Burnley fans that day. <laughs> it's funny, I think what happened was because it's, I mean, obviously, we grew up, I grew up in Glasgow, I'm for the Gorgos, and you grew up, we were certainly either day either in Glasgow, it was Celtic at Rangers at the time, I was obviously Celtic after, as you know. Uh, but when I played in Scotland, whether it was Falkirk or the United or Motherwell, uh, you know, good, good clubs, but it used to, I used to get pissed off, I really did, when, see when I was driving in to play a home game for the team and there was buses leaving to go and support Celtic and Rangers Aye. for the Aye. town. I used, to myself, I used to think to myself, fucking support your local team. And I Aye. think all the clubs in Scotland would be a lot better off for it. Stay in the town, support your local team, get behind them. The reason I mention that is, see when I went down to Burnley, the only thing you've seen in Burnley was Burnley shirts. You never seen Man United, you never seen Liverpool, you never seen mm. nothing but Burnley. They, they were so passionate and about that. And to be fair, we used that because everybody bought into what we were doing. And again, the young players were a huge part. The best example was when young Jay Rodriguez, who's been on to be an, an, an absolute star, as you know, in the Premier League. 
but Jay was only 16 and a half, 17. I sent him up to, to Ray Moore, my pal, Alan Moore at Stirling Albion, because we knew Jay was talented, but he, he wasn't quite ready to play the team. So but I knew coming up to Scotland to play with Stirling Albion in the league, it'd be a tough, you know, tough learning trust. The, the boys when they gear him, they'd be banging them out physically, they'd get stronger. And it's six months at Stirling Albion with Moore, he did great. And then when he came back to Burnley, he was ready to challenge to get in the team. And, and to your point as well, what happened that year we got promoted? We we played sixty one games that season. We had the we had the we we were actually financially embargoed from the January. We couldn't send any we couldn't send any more players because we owed money to Manchester United for an add on payment for Chris Eagles. We owed money to Scunthorpe for an add on payment for Martin Patterson. So I never told anybody. I just kept it between me and the was a guy put the money in the club and uh, the co-owner, the guy who brought sales. So we couldn't sign any players from January. So playing 61 games, we actually, we used the fewest amount of players in the championship for those 24 teams. Is this connection right? Yeah, just you know, stayed on But the thing about it was that we were on, we had brilliant cup runs and everybody was starting to get aware of who Burnley were. And particularly people in Scotland, because you came down, they want you to do well. And I think we kind of became everybody's second favourite team, if that makes any sense. And, ah, yeah, uh, yeah. and the, support, the support just kept going and going. And... Yeah, that's what I mean. That day you won the playoff final. Me and my mate got a skin full in the pub. Went out for lunch and all that, watched the game. He <laughs> needs to a pair of dafties and a pub in Coke Rudd, you know what I mean? <laughs> it was appreciated. I mean, I had, a, I had about 100 down for the Gorbals. All can do watches at Wembley. It's, it's, it sounds crazy because there's 80,000 there. But you can actually recognise their voices. <laughs> <laughs> but on when you look back, it's, it's unbelievable to say that you got to play in the Cup Winners' Cup with Airdrie against Sparta Prague after getting to the Scottish Cup final. What was that whole experience like? I that was uh, that was incredible because well, for such a small club, but we did great. I mean, obviously we got the Cup Final. Rangers were the champions and beat us two one at Hamden. But because they were champions, we didn't qualify for the. Aye. The cup winners' cup was to play Sparta Prague, so it was like for for like for Airdrie, it's just an incredible experience. And the and the great thing was the club were really good, you know, in that respect because they brought all the like the players, girlfriends, wives, uh, fiancés, and they took them all over to Prague for the, for the game as well. And we actually did really well in both games. And they had some, I mean, they had some outstanding players. Players would not be you know top top players in Europe in their team, but it was a great experience. I mean, we Jimmy Boyle, a good pal of mine, he actually even missed a penalty over in Prague. So, uh, so it, it, it was a brilliant experience. Everybody was in it together. And that's the thing about football. I think when you get success is, is when everybody's everybody's got the same same agenda. Aye, you know, sometimes aye. in football, what can happen? And it happens at all different levels. But sometimes somebody's got different ideas for somebody else. And when that happens, it does it does not sit well because players. Are, what you need, I think, for a football club is like an extension of family. Everybody's got to be in it together. And of course, you'll have your arguments, your ups and downs. But in the main. You've still all got to be pulling in the same direction. But when you get people that come with a different agenda, that doesn't help football clubs in any way. Aye, I think if, you've, <clears throat> if you have teams that are, like if you have arguments and stuff, like families have arguments, so you want the team to be like that. If you have a fight, you've got a difference of opinion, it's good to air that and get it out and then just get it done and dusted. I think that makes a team stronger. I think you've, I think you've got an opinion. I think but you've also got to know where the line is. And I think it's, it's healthy to have a chat, take on board, okay, I'll take that on board. But ultimately, when all said and done in football, there's a final decision that's made. But when that's made, everybody's got to buy into that. It's yeah. when that's made and other people have different, that's when it, when it leads to issues and challenges and different stuff. But, I mean, I've been really fortunate that the groups I've had, I mean, have terrific groups of players and, and, and players that all come together and do their best and try and help each other. And when you do that, you can achieve success in football. Aye, so saying that, you've played for, I don't know, many teams in Scottish football. What was your favourite time? Have you got a favourite? Have you got a favourite time for your time in Scottish football? Uh, it's, it's so hard because you're right. I mean, I played, as you know, I don't know, 11 or 12 clubs. There was a simple reason for that. I just wanted to play. So if I went to a club, for example, that, as a striker, and uh, particularly when I was a bit older, if I was on the bench or whatever, I think myself, I just wanted to play. I mean, I, I dropped three or four times, I dropped salary and go and play because I just wanted to start games and play and enjoy. Because when you train every day, the purpose is to have a game at the weekend. But what's happened, and it's probably happened uh, with finance and football. I mean, I've had uh, uh, players at, at different clubs that, that if they weren't in the team, it didn't really matter to them. And that, 
I don't, that's no good to me. I need players that are hurting if they're not in that starting 11. I mean, talking about 18, I'm talking, if you're not in that starting 11, you should be hurting and working even harder at training, trying to get yourself a team. I mean, again, I know everybody has different challenges and everything else, but to have your career in football, I mean, I don't think it gets any better than that. No, no. Right, I think nowadays, though, it's not the same as back, back in the day when it was like, foot, the money in football wasn't as ridiculous as it is now. No, no, I mean, see like, see, like down in England, see if a, a team sign a player in, like, for the second string, it's happy to sit there because he's picking up 80, 90 grand a week. You know what I mean? Yeah. But there's no, well, there's not, there's nothing out of For example, I, I mean, I've, I've, when I think back to, for example, Bolton, and I, uh, I inherited the team there, and there was, I think there was 10 players that still would go. But they weren't really playing the team. Because when I went in the Bolton, Bolton were bottom of the league. So, but the challenge then is if they're not good enough for Bolton, nobody else in the Premier League is going to take them because they're down at the bottom. Mm-hmm. Because they're on big salaries, the ones in the Championship can't, can't afford them. So the players then end up sitting in that contract for, for two years. Now, that's just about a circumstance and everything else. But I think when those, those 10 players left, there was something like, I don't know, let's even say there was like... I think it was like twelve million pounds between them or something, you know, in terms of the salary that could have been used for different things. So again, I think it's important now, but and again, it's all it's all different levels because as you come down the levels, I've got to say, even in Scotland and some of the leagues, the boys that are full time, you know, boys that have got a good trade are earning far more money than those boys that are full time footballers. So I think we've got to be balanced to to where we're talking about the different levels. But no, there, there is there is at the very highest level because of the TV money really. You know, it's escalated. Another thing that happened with that is, for example, when the TV deals came about, say you a Wayne Rooney, let's say, for example, who was on a huge amount of money. So, but for Wayne Rooney's team, it's probably a squad of 26 players. So maybe the guy is at number 24, 25, 26 in the squad. They know they're not as talented as Wayne Rooney. So let's say Wayne Rooney was getting 200 grand a week. So the guy said, well, do you know what? I'm not like Wayne Rooney. I'm not 200 grand a week, but I'm in the squad. I'm worth 40 a week. When you're not really in terms of your ability, but because the highest, the highest ones are pushing the boundaries away up, then everything else kind of drops down. That's, that's definitely the way to look at it. But it's uh, looking at, I, th- I think that a bit of the hungers went out of the game for the young players, you know. And it's uh, it, for me, it's for me, it's a wee bit sad. You see players like, see just for talking sake, you see players like Calvin Miller and that that are at Celtic, and they're not quite there yet to get into the first team. And they're happy to sit there. And I would see if that was me personally, I'd be I'd be looking at all avenues to get to a team that I could actually be a regular starter with, you know, and like then you can maybe build yourself up and make your reputation on that. And then when you maybe you've got the chance to come back to a Celtic or Rangers or a, a Burnley or a QPR or something like that, you're then ready to go into that first team as an established player. You know what I mean? Yeah. They don't see. They all want to live the football lifestyle, but they don't want to put in the football work. Aye. So <clears throat> like a couple of weeks ago, we had Ross McCrory on the show. Yeah. <clears throat> and he says when he, when he went back to pre-season last season, him and Gerard had a chat, and Gerard says, "Look, you're not going to be playing every week." But Ross McCrory was saying, "I need to be playing every week." So he took his chance, went down to Portsmouth on loan. That's what you want for a player. You want the hunger to play football. You want to well, just be sitting there picking up a wage. Do you know what I mean? No, I, I agree with you. I think, obviously, if you're, for example, at, at an elite club like Celtic or Rangers, obviously your dream is that you want to play for, uh, for your team. But I think what's got to happen for me in football is I think there's, you've got to realise as a player, you know, what level are you, or what level am I at just now? I'm at that level that I can get in that. Celtic first team, Rangers first team, no. Ross McCrory mentioned who wanted to play consistently. Maybe instead of sitting on the bench and what have you. And for young players, I agree. I think for me, young players, and I've had a lot of different clubs, I've always done it. I always put them out and loan for a reason that they learn the game. They're playing against men, they understand. And to your point, if you get a loan, you play well and you can back, you can back a better player, ready to push into that. But I think the the gap is the best way I could put it. The gap between like under 21 football or reserve football, whatever you want to call it, to first team football, particularly in Scotland, it's a huge gap. So you've got to find a way to bridge the gap. So for me, that's playing league football, playing against tough opponents every week. And sometimes there's nothing wrong with taking a step back to take two forward. Aye. You believe in your own ability. The reason I mentioned it, and it's a brilliant point you make, particularly young players, 
And I'll tell you why, because if those players sit for those two or three years, their development hasn't increased. They've just plateaued out. Whereas if they had those two or three years playing at a high level, tough opponents, they might not be at the elite club that you wanted to get. But ultimately, I always say, see if you're good enough, you're going to get to that level anyway. Because people aren't going to, if you're playing well, people are not going to ignore you. They're going to look and say, I'll tell you what, he's improved a ton for playing at that level. Mm-hmm. And I mean, even the boy, uh, and I know it was a bit of a furore about him yesterday, but if you think of the boy Gallagher at Motherwell, who was at Celtic and dropped down and starting level, 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 all of a sudden he's a Scotland international and everything else. Now, all credit to boys like that because the other thing is, well, when they've left those big clubs, you're dealing with rejection. And that's a tough thing, I think, particularly for young players. And not every player has the, has the tools and the skills to deal with that rejection. Some of them end up getting lost in the game. So I think for me, I think that's why, particularly the elite clubs, they've got to find a way when they look at these young talents, what's the best way for their development? Not only for their own football club, but, but, but actually for the player himself to develop yeah. this boy so he's on to, to a good career at whatever level. Definitely, mate. 100% agree. And I'm so, also, uh, do, you, do you think any of the players that you, you brought through at Burnley would have been good enough for a shot at glory? Exactly. <laughs> 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 I was just about uh, to say, in amongst uh, your football career, you dipped your toes in the old movie uh, business or all. I, 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 mean? I think, I think ability wise, I think ability wise, you could have handled the shot at glory, but the acting skills, no, no, the way, no, the way, no, the way. I tell you what, it's not often you and Ali McCoy can act Robert De Valla uh, off the screen. I, you know what, Chris, to be honest, it was, it was, it was brilliant, and I'll tell you why. And I think I mentioned to this news before at the charity game, because when I sit and watch a movie or you watch the, the TV, up to that point, I think, right, great, great. But I've got to say, never for a minute did I, did I understand the hard work, the detail, the expertise that goes in there. And I've got to say, it was eye-opening. It really was. It was incredible. Obviously, you know better than me. There was a little bit of, about, uh, a little bit of downtime, a little bit of boredom in that. But we just, I gave a keep you up. I gave a head tennis and everything else. And the funny thing was, I mean, they always say such a huge star, but, but Robert Duvall, Robert Duvall absolutely loved, he loved the banter. So he, he would spend lunch with us, with the football boys. He loved, oh, he loved the camaraderie, the banter in amongst the football boys. And he was, uh, he was incredible. But, but talking about Croisty, we were doing a, well, I think it was, a, it was either the quarterfinal or the semifinal down at Queen of the South. And uh, the, the goalkeeper, you've, you've probably seen a number of movies, the goalkeeper was Cole, Cole Hauser who was in Goodwill Hunting and yeah. a lot of big movies. And obviously, uh, Brian Cox, uh, you met Croisty, uh, uh, Michael Keaton. I mean, some of the stars. Were, was it A-listers, movie? man. A-listers. And obviously, Robert DeVar. Robert DeVar was just down to earth. He was so humble and so grounded. But we went to Queen of the South, and there was a, a guy called Michael Corrente. And he said, right, boy, this is what I wanted you to do. Uh, Jimmy Boyle was the team, Peter Harrison, Silky, they were playing the right-hand side. Me and Coyce, they were playing through the middle as the strikers. And he said, right, Jimmy, I want you to play two one twos with Selke, Peter Hairston. Peter, Selke, you play the ball to the byline for, for Jimmy Boyle. Jimmy, you cross it in. Ali, Coyce, I want you in the penalty spot to go up, do a bicycle kick, and put the ball in the top corner. And we're, we're like, oh, that's happening. <laughs> right, right. So, right, okay, that's going to happen. And Coyce is like, yeah, yeah, no problem. Yeah, I'll do it. I'll do it. Yeah, no problem. Do it first time. So anyway, we're all looking at each other. Fuck it. And the thing about it was, see, every time there was a goal scored or something happened, because we were just there for the football, we were obviously trying to get a sail in the frame, so we were in the film, right? But, <laughs> yeah, every, honestly, even the, the goalkeeper, everybody was running in on a pylon trying to get in the goal. Anyway, we do this, do the one-two, the two-one-two, it's goes to Jimmy Boyle. Jimmy Boyle, great ball, lifts it right in. So I'm in there with Coyce with the two... Uh, Centre half. So I've pulled the left to give him this space at the, the penalty spot. So sure enough, the ball coist, he goes up, overhead kick, as goes my judge, forgive me for swearing, it after I'll no swear. Anyway, boom, top corner. You couldn't believe it. So you done it first time. Oh honestly, and, but as much as we were trying to get the picture, this was genuine elation. We couldn't actually believe it happened. <laughs> <laughs> every one of us, every one of us on top of were going, no, un- and he can't believe it. Unbelievable. So he gets up. So he goes like that, cut. So Michael Carretti shouts, cut. And he looks to the camera and he says, did you get that? And the camera man says, yeah, I think so, but could we get through it again? <laughs> 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 we must have tried him 
30 times, no chance. <laughs> it was incredible. First time it was, oh, but that was, that was, that was my choice for you. It like I love, it was, like one, like, one of the stories he tells about that. Tell you, stories he tells. He's <laughs> unbelievable. Huh? He felt the clay that came out with a salmon in his mouth. Huh? <laughs> one, of the, one of the stories he tells about that is, he says, uh, to miss a penalty filming the movie. He says, it uh, took me 10 takes to miss uh, the penalty. <laughs> <laughs> it, was a, it, was a fi- it was a final at Hampton. That's right. No, I was in the banter. And, but I've got to say, I was, it kind of opened my eyes to the, how the, the hard work, the detail that goes into. You know, even when I think about like, coming back in different days and making sure the exact same you know, clothing was on, there wasn't the exact same, there wasn't a mark. Mark a butt on it. It was incredible. It was unbelievable how it was done. Oh, and I'm going to show my wife you saying this. Just you realising how much hard work is on. Because when I go to work, he thinks I'm away for a laugh. Oh, I'll, I'll, I'll be honest with you. I would have thought that until I actually went in and witnessed it. I mean, the detail, it was incredible. Robert DeVal was, uh, was a I'm just trying to, I'm just trying to imagine in my head John Martin sitting at lunch with Michael Keaton, Robert Duvall. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I can tell you it was an experience. What a boys, man. What a boys. <laughs> it sounds class, man. It sounds class. But back to your career own right. International level. Do you think you should have got maybe a chance at international level? Well, I think you should have. Do you, Chris? A hundred percent. I mean, well, the thing is, obviously, obviously, I played once for Ireland. So uh, I had the choice. I had the choice under twenty one level to play for Scotland or Ireland. I was in the Barton and doing really well in the Championship First Division. Uh, but I've got to say, the Scotland under twenty one team at the time, they were all like top Premier League players playing for Celtic Rangers. But the other thing is, when I I grew up in the in the Glamos, and where we grew up was called like, Little Donegal. It was all you know, families for Donegal. So. We were brought up in Irish culture and everything else. To be honest, it was a huge thing for my mum and dad, who are obviously not with me anymore. And, uh, and the thing about Ireland, I was going to get an opportunity to play. Whereas we all due respect the Scotland players at the time were brilliant players. And I, if I'm honest, they were better than me at the time. The strikers, uh, Jukebox, Gordon Jury, Robert Fleck were playing at... Uh, uh, well, Jukey was just about to go for Hibs and Rangers. Fleck was already there. Joe Miller was wide in the right. Derek Ferguson, and Peter Grant were playing in the middle. Uh, David Robertson, it was all like Aberdeen Celtic Rangers. And the, in terms of uh, where they were in their career, they were ahead of me. I've, I've always been honest about my ability and where I kind of pitched and things. So it was a great opportunity for my mum and my dad and the family wise. And I'm really lucky because I'm really, I'm proud to be born in the, you know, come from the Gormals. And I'm also proud of the fact of my Irish heritage as well. So I kind of did the best of both worlds. And uh, But the game was actually, it was Scotland v Ireland the Easter Road. <laughs> that, that was oh, the game. That's right, yeah. I remember that. It was actually the night before Mark Lawrence had scored at Hamden to beat Scotland 1 0. And Ireland ended up, that was the first Euros that Big Jack and the team ended up qualifying for because Gary, Gary Mackay scored the winner for Scotland in Bulgaria. Aye. And that, that meant the Republic qualified for the Euros. But anyway, it was the night before at Easter Road. And at that time, you were allowed two over 21s in your under 21 team. And the two over under 21s for Scotland were Campbell Money at St. Murray, was a really good goalkeeper. And Big Alec, Big Alec McLeish, who was coming back for the injury. <coughs> Big Ed played. I think that's one of the reasons he ended up signing me later. I always seem to do well when I played against them. But I ended up scoring after 90 seconds for Ireland. All played through. When Rune Big Alec, as if he wasn't there, came <laughs> away, Rune the side of him and just, just slotted it in. I've got to keep balanced it. We ended up getting whacked 4-1 because I, 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 did tell you, I did tell you that Scotland team were a good team. But the experience was brilliant. And then I was involved under 23, B International. 
eventually got one cap just before the 94 World Cup. We beat, we actually beat Holland 1-0 in Holland. And a very good friend of mine, a good pal, Tommy Coyne. Tommy scored the winner. Tommy scored the winner in Holland. So it was a big boost to beat Holland in Holland just before the 94 World Cup. And I was actually, because sometimes in football things come your way, and sometimes they don't, but I'm always in the nature that I pick myself up and I go again and everything else. So I was actually uh, named in the provisional 26-man squad for the World Cup for Ireland, for America in 94. Now, in my, if I'm honest, I knew I wouldn't be in the 20, but it was quite flattering to be in the 26. But wow. I had to go over and we had to go over and do all the commercial stuff, you know, in the, the build-up to the, uh, uh, the... And we had the, the World Cup song. So we're flying over from Manchester, myself, Jason McAteer, and Paul... Uh, Paul McGrath was, was flying oh, over the is, so, is that the song that he's done with Charlie and the boys? <laughs> uh, we did it, I, I'm not sure who did it, but it was, it was, the, re, it was the reference to, uh, there was a reference to Jimmy Hill in it. It was something about Jimmy Hill, mind your, mind your house, or kind of watch your, watch your back stuff. But the, great, the funny thing about the story was that uh, Paul McGrath is the nicest man in the world you'll ever meet. Obviously Paul's been knowing that he liked a couple of beers now and again. So we're, we're flying from Manchester, and uh, so I said, oh, hi, Paul, good morning. Good morning, Owen, very polite. Anyway, we're going to play, and they said to get out, it was for final. We went there, it was a couple of drinks. So Paul got a couple of drinks and uh, kind of relaxed them. So, and I like to think, the same as you, I mean, I like to think I can talk a little bit. So next minute, Paul's a couple, he's well relaxed. Paul's trying to wait a little bit, so brilliant. It was the conversation, the 35-minute flight flew in. So anyway, when we get there, we were doing a thing at Opal, for, which was the cars, uh, uh, they made the cars and all that. So we did that thing. Oh, yeah, did another uh, sponsor in the morning. And then we went to Guinness at lunchtime to do a big promotion at Guinness. <laughs> Guinness get the pictures too. So Paul's there, another few beers. And the boys are having a couple of beers. Jack said, have a few beers. So the boys are yeah, back the way, enjoying the lunch and everything else. Uh, doing all the promotional stuff. Did a couple of things in the afternoon. Uh, again, the, the hospitality was there. So at the end of the time we got, it was, I think it was six o'clock to make the, the World Cup song. So all we had to do was come in with three lines in the chorus. That's all we had to do. The band was saying whatever they were saying. We came in with three lines in the chorus, and that was that job done. Boy says, you'll be here 10 minutes, done and dusted. So the boys are rattling away through the thing. So we have to come in with three lines in the chorus. In we come. Paul McGrath, brilliant. Paul's away with this time. He's enjoyed his day, done all his stuff. Paul was just making up his own words. Right? <laughs> right, cut, cut. As God's my judge, it took 10 takes. And then Big, ja Big Jack eventually like, I'll just take him over there out the road to get this finished. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> Priceless. But that, that was a great experience, obviously. I mean, that probably Ireland. Really, really good team, really good players. And so, all good, all good. It gives you an idea. Sorry, it gives you an idea of how good a player McGraw was, though. Oh. He never trained. He never trained and he got into World Cup squads, you know what I mean? What a football. I, had, uh, I was going to say the good fortune, but... I, I actually played against them. Uh, he was the best defender I've ever played against. We played against I, them. That's uh, oh, we, we actually, believe it or not, we actually won the game. It was a quarter final in the FA Cup uh, uh, for Bolton against Aston Villa. Uh, uh, and we won 1 0. Big Stubbsy, Big Alan Stubbs scored a 25 yard free kick. But myself, John McGinley, played up front. And McGinley will tell you as well Paul McGrath never, never got a kick in the ball. Any two years. And the other thing was, see when the ball went up and you're coming to head of it, you could hear him coming behind you. Aye. He frightened the life, he frightened the life of you. Because you thought, oh, I'm going to get a touch. He's just going to <laughs> But out with the physicality, his football ability. And this, this was a man as well, that he couldn't train all week because if he trained, his knees blew up and he wasn't able to play. So he just used to play Saturday, maybe a Wednesday, or if he couldn't play the Wednesday, he just went Saturday to Saturday, but no training in between. Always think back if he'd stayed like healthy and fit, for me, he'd be the best defender in the world. If he was training every day, oh, Aye. Do you insane. think how much would he be worth in the market these days? If Aye. he trained, it would be fit. like Virgil van Dyke esque, you know what I mean? Like money wise, you know what I mean? Absolutely. Absolutely. I'll struggling. tell you what, he was, ten, he was 10 times the player that Harry Maguire is. Harry Maguire oh. went from 80 million Aye. quid, you know what I mean? Aye. Well, again, and, and this is what's happening, Chris, what you mentioned earlier on. See, because of the TV money. Now, I think Harry Maguire is a really good player, but. Aye. The market, oh, like that. <laughs> yeah, no, but the, mar the market gets inflated, but it gets inflated when it's home, when it's homegrown players as well. So because he's an English player, can can back off the big tournament. All of a sudden, 
you're playing, you're beating them higher, isn't it? So, and that's what happens. But, uh, but I mean, Paul McGrath would be, un- be unbuyable. I think I don't know how much you'd have to pay for. Him. Talking about like the Premiership down in England, like with your time at Burnley, obviously you got big wins there at Man United. And that how, what was it like being a manager in that league? How much was it? The pressure, well, the pressure. No, well, that? Aye, well, the thing is because of the, the football's the same game, the, the exact same game. What there is, there's different levels, but in essence, it's the same game. We all play it, we all love it, we play the same way. But the higher you get, particularly you get to the Premier League, the, the league's loaded with pace and power. So the best example I always thought was when I played, for example, at Bolton in the Championship, scored a lot of goals, got promoted, scored in the playoff final at Wembley to get promoted into the Premier League as a player. Uh, but whereas in the Championship, when I went through one-on-one with the goalkeeper, a yard ahead of the defender and was able to finish. So, but when you went in the Premier League, these defenders, we mentioned Paul McGrath, Virgil van Dijk, these boys are like athletes, they're lightning quick. So... When I went in the Premier League, which I did with Bolton, I was on the bench. I started two games, I was on the bench for all, and that's why I left and went in the D night. I just wanted to play. But they were better defenders because they were quicker, so they could recover the mistakes. So, for example, if I, if I went one and one through the goalkeeper in the Premier League, and a Gary Cahill, who I had at Bolton, was chasing me, Gary Cahill would recover on you. So, the chance you had to score a goal in the Championship, you're not getting the same chance in the Premier League. And that's what happens. The level gets higher and higher. But in terms of being in the league, then... We, we knew we were good, we were, we knew we believed in our abilities, we knew we were good players, we knew we could organise teams. and So that never faced me. I mean, I beat them all. You mentioned Man United, Arsenal, Chelsea, what have you. We'd, we'd managed to beat them all. We did it playing. This was the thing I enjoyed. I enjoyed. We played the way we wanted. We never went put everybody behind the ball and try to steal a set player. We played them. We stood toe-to-toe with them and, and we played them. As a matter of fact, my 10 games, because I had 10 home games at Burnley in the Premier League, we won five and we drew four. We only lost one game, which was actually against Wigan. No reason we lost it. The big goalkeeper I had, big Brian Jensen, the beast. Aye. Oh, unbelievably was big Brian Jensen for me. But Brian actually went to clear the ball and turned his ankle against Wigan. And the ball just sat there. wasn't. Hugo, Hugo Rodriguez just tapped from one yard down, just tapped into the net. Otherwise, we probably wouldn't have lost that game as well. But when they came, they knew they were running for a football game. And that's how we played. And I mentioned earlier about the Burnley fans. They played a huge part. Because one of the reasons I probably got the job at Burnley was they weren't winning a lot of home games. But when you had the fans on side and behind the team, yes. I mean, but, but you see, big, a you see it, big, yeah. You know, yeah, big Sean, big Sean's done it again now. Big Sean Dyson has got it as a fortress, and that's where we had it. Right. Nobody wanted to come and play us. And it, I think it holds something like 23, 24,000. But right. the atmosphere was incredible. A bit like, you know, we mentioned Brockville, and right. Right, in, right in top of you, and the fans are, you know, it's, a brilliant, brilliant atmosphere. But the funny one where you mentioned that Man United. So Sir Alex had been good to me, as I mentioned. I mentioned Chris Eagles. And it, so he was texting me and he came to a few of my games that year. So he was always sending the messages, well done on you, keep it going, bum bum. So when we won the playoff final, one of the first messages I got after the game was for Sir Alex. He says, well done on, that was incredible. Great achievement. Great to see you. Uh, uh, you know, you know, for the Gondos boy and everything else. We love that. You know, he's brilliant. And the thing people don't realise about Sir Alex, as talented he was a football manager, See the care he had for other people, particularly right. young, young managers. He was always there their phone. He was always there to help you. He was he had a great nature. He was brilliant. That. You know, he was fantastic. I would, he was, I would have text, <clears throat> Sorry, I had a text you that day and all, but I couldn't fucking see. I was that drunk. <laughs> you, were, you were still <laughs> sorry. <laughs> but anyway, so, so, so the text said, uh, but remember, when I come to visit you at Tough Moor, make sure you've got a couple of nice bottles of red wine for me and my staff. I'll send you. I'll send you my wine magazine, right? I think I said that. Now, so anyway, as it happens, our first home game was against Man United, two times yeah, yeah. champions. They were going to make it three in a row this year. So I said to Dan Bentley, who's still at the club, I says, Dan, you need to give me a couple of nice bottles of red wine for St Alex and staff in the day of the game. So I'm, I'm always in early, maybe four or five hours before the kickoff. So Dan goes away, he comes back, he hands me these wine notes. I kind of read through these. I thought. I'm, bear in mind, I'm too tall. Never had a drink alcohol in my life. Aye. I thought, I'll never carry that off. Anyway, only Dan Bentley was there. Muggins, I think it was three or four hundred quid for the, for the bottles of wine. Muggins went and put the two bottles of red wine in the fridge. He said, what are you doing in the car, Paul? <laughs> I said, I says, what? He says, no, no, that's going to breathe at room temperature. <laughs> so, so only Dan, Dan was there. He done but anyway, we were there, as you're right, we were going to beat the 1-0 in the night. And the Burnley, the atmosphere was incredible. I've got to say, an unbelievable atmosphere. Just think to a bu- couple of bottles of red wine for a man for the gorbals. That's just a couple of bottles of buck you should have got. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
Did you, did you regret the move to Bolton on? No, I think what, what happens, see, in football you're always charged with different decisions. You know, when I went to Bolton, I played at Bolton and I love Burnley and everything else and I went through that because where we were, we'd drawn a few, couple of games in November and I said, you know, I, I, I said to him at the time, listen, I need a couple of players in January because when we went into the, this is, when we went into the Premier League, at the time, it's changed now with the new TV deals, but at the time, the bottom team in the league would receive, and it was £33 million, you finish bottom, £33 million TV money, then your, your own revenue streams and top of that. Aye, aye. My, my budget from the playing staff in the league was £16 million. I had the lowest budget ever in the Premier League. But right. it didn't phase me because I knew I had good players, I knew we had a great team spirit. And, uh, and uh, so we did that. But when it came November, we'd drawn a couple of games, I thought we could have won. So I said to him, and I understand why the directors have put a lot of their own money in. So they obviously had to get their loans back. That's not, no problem with that. But what I was saying, come January, I need a couple of players to freshen up and boost it. And again, it, was, it wasn't a great time because it was the housing market crash, you remember. Uh, right. So... Right. So the director said, well, listen, we've only got our money back. You know, we're not really in a great position to put it back in. So really, it just continued. Were, were they going to hurt or was it going to take for granted? Oh, another thing, because I'd been at Bolton as a player, I knew the club and everything else, there was a wee bit of attachment there. But when I went to Bolton, Bolton were bottom of the league. We kept Bolton up by nine points. The yeah. following year at Bolton, we Bolton in the top seven for three quarters of the season. Went in the FA Cup and then we'd obviously some horrendous injuries and everything else. So ultimately, Stephen, it's like anything else. Probably yourselves with if you have an acting job or this or that. And the bottom line is you make a decision at the time and then you go on. You know, and, exactly. and you do. I mean, obviously, uh, there was other things that happened before that with different clubs and, and everything else. And I'd stayed at Burnley. So, uh, but they're a brilliant club with brilliant people. And the other thing as well, I'm not one of them in football. I never have anything negative or anything bad to say about people because that, that's not how I live my life. Whatever's happened, happened. Wish you all the best. I don't have any bad feeling towards anybody. We'd want to and we all move on. It's the best way to look at life, Owen. Best way to look at life, mate. Definitely. So you getting back to like uh, after your your stint with Burnley and then Bolton. Um there was a lot of, there was a lot of talk about you getting the Celtic job run about it well, two on two different occasions. Um how close did did you actually come to Well, I, well that's what I kinda of alluded to there. When I was when I when I got when I took Burnley up when the, the game that you were in the pub and we were mate enjoying bump mile, that, that playoff day, that was the very same day that, that Gordon that Gordon resigned. That's right. So, so the, why is that right? I remember it was, that. It was the same day because obviously after the game. So, uh, Celtic's my team and it will always be my team and that will never ever change. You know? Uh, and of course, to, uh, I spoke to, obviously, Peter, I spoke to Dermot and everything else and, uh, and that's the thing but of course, Particularly bothering people think we left, but I'd obviously had a chance at that time uh, to go to Celtic. And but my kids were really young, we we're just down here and we're settled. Uh, beautiful part of the world, I've got to say where we still are. And uh, and really what had to happen, I kinda had to take the emotion out of it because if you just make the emotion decision, you know, right. Celtic's your team or, or Rangers your team and that that never will change. But because my kids were uh, at such a young age. Did I want to kind of take them back into that environment at the time? And really, and I was, if I'm honest, I was in the best league in the world. I was in the Premier League, which was the best league in the world. So from a, from a football perspective, you know, so, so really that was it. So I, listen, that's what happens as a player. I mean, I've been close to play a couple of times as well, but that's what happens. And, uh, and we always say it's no for you, you know, it's, it's no meant to be one other reason, but it still doesn't take away from your team and, you know, you're always going to support them and, and, and want the best for them. Do you think that you kind of you cracked it a wee bit by not taking the job after you seen what happened with Mowbray? Because the see the that was a rebuild that Gordon Stratton left there. That was a, a rebuild. I, I I think that's I think that's always a challenge when you come into the job. I think you have to uh, weigh up that scenario. You know, is there a good team that you've inherited that you're ready to you know, move on? I think Lenny would be the first to say that. Uh, having done so well when Lenny did and then when he came in he inherited a good team for Brendan and then Lenny's added his touches as well and, and took it on again but sometimes you don't inherit a good team and right. then that's then you've got you know and the, the, the thing that, that managers need when that happens and this is the one thing we don't get is time time you know, we talk about the uh, Chris made a great point we talk about the, the game changing the game has changed because 
and particularly, in, and again, with the, the social media and everything else, everybody's got opinion and rightly so and what have you. But what that happens is that then allows more pressure to come on, like chairman or board of directors in terms of a manager. And my point is, when that happens, that you inherit, it's a not so good team. That manager, you don't come in and click your fingers and sprinkle fairy dust. You need, you know, it's hard work. It's going on the training ground, it's repetition. It's bringing players in that suit the way you want to play. And the one thing Sandy managers don't get now, uh, that commodity is time. And you're right, I think, I think Tony had a big job to, to do there, to rebuild, and it probably took a wee bit of time. But, you know, the thing with Celtic managers is, particularly those two, you're not going to get time because second, as we that. know, second, well, second, second's not good enough in Glasgow, we know that. Aye. Oh, if I know that, I know that all too well to know. And I think that, I think that's been part of the reason why in the last few weeks about the, you know, with everything with the leagues and everything else, because it's it's hard to take when you when you're not the team that wins. And Celtic know that from the time when when Rangers had a fantastic team I played against, and they were sensational that team. I've got to say they were, you know, some of the boys and that they were they were unplayable at times. So I think both sides of City have known that, but, uh, but obviously just now I'm mean, Celtic get huge dominance at the moment. Aye, and I know it, I know it, and I need to listen to Tom tell me every week, Oh, you know what I mean, every week. Every the, only thing, the only thing I said, I thought about it, Stephen, was at the time, was that, uh, and I understand, because I think Lenny and the players would have been first to tell you, they'd have loved to get the games finished on the field. There's, there's no doubt about that. Every, yeah. player, every player, every manager, Lenny will tell you that, they'd love to be there. But because of this, which is so, you know, these unforeseen circumstances and everything else, Aye. But the thing that, when I looked at it, I thought to myself, you know, nobody really mentioned that, that Dundee United wouldn't have won the league, because we all believe Dundee United. Dundee United were 14 points ahead with, with a game Aye. in hand, and eight games left, and Celtic were 13 with eight games left. Yeah. But the thing about it was, Dundee United had dropped 25 points, and Celtic had dropped 10. If Aye. anybody had a chance of being caught, it would have been Dundee United, as Aye. opposed to Celtic. The reason being... Celtic Rangers, and particularly up to the new year, Celtic Rangers are so far ahead of everybody, miles ahead of everybody. And that's why the margins for, at that time, Celtic Rangers dropping points were minimal. And whatever happened in the second half of the season, but there's no doubt the first half of the season, Rangers were terrific. You know, that was, it was nip and tuck, it really was. And then Celtic have obviously had a great run from, from January. Rangers have not got to the level they were before. But the thing is, no, no harm in the rest of the Premier League, but they're not going to take points off Celtic. So no. that was that was my point in it. No, definitely, man. I mean, Rangers when they come back, it was just it was like night and day for up until New Year to when they come back. And Celtic's consistency as soon as they get back was just phenomenal. You were never they were never getting caught. Nobody. That's was, that. And listen, that's as a as, as a football person and other. That's the ones that we all scratch your head about because we think so. You know, the, how can you get to the level Rangers are at? Because not only the the old firm game. I mean, I, I love football. I Celtic man. I'm also honest in my assessment of football. If somebody's yeah. done really well, I'm the first to say, you know, they've done really well. And, you know, Rangers at Parkhead, the game, they were outstanding. The cup final, they were also outstanding. But my point is, when you've got to that level, to be a champion, it needs to, that has to be sustained. Exactly. I actually think, like, you look at the two games, right? Rangers were on the very top of their game. Absolutely. The Celtic were terrible. You know what I mean? It's, it's, at some point, it's going to come when it goes like that, you know, so... It's I know, the other thing, well, yes, but the other thing Chris you've got as well, and this is, again, I think Rangers did deserve enormous credit because sometimes, as a team, sometimes you're only allowed to be as good as the other team let you be. So sometimes you've got to give credit to say, we weren't that good because they they were better on us that day. Or That's the thing, they, they absolutely overran the midfield, the, the two <laughs> games, and they bossed the games. I think the thing we all knew from, well, I certainly felt anyway, from... from uh, January onwards is that Celtic know how to win. They know how to be champions. They know how when they've had, which they did, when they've had a, uh, a bad day uh, as they had at the, the New Year, you know, whatever you want to call it, that game just before New Year or whatever it was. They, when you've had that punch in the nose, they know how to bounce back. Right. They know they've got that character within the dressing room. They know how to get themselves back up to the level they were again. And that's why I thought the second half of the season is going to be, it's going to be great. If Rangers can sustain that, because Celtic are going to ramp it up. Celtic are going to, as they always do in those last months of the season, get better again. And the only, as I said, two two defeats and two draws. That's Celtic have had. So that shows you, in terms of the level of consistency that they've had. This is insane. It's insane. 
I'm just waiting on an email back for Rangers Bucks. I says I'm not renewing my season ticket if they've still got to Dubai next year again. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> I wonder what they do when they go over there. They come back half the football they were. It's funny because uh, I, I, under, like, I, I understand why the, you would go to Dubai, obviously with the, with the break, then the warm weather training and everything else. And I get all that. Uh, then part of me thinks, because I think of what, for psychologically, for example, so when I played at Bolton, uh, when we were preparing for the playoff final as a player, Bruce Rio, Colin Todd took us to Valde Lobo in Portugal, to a place called Barrington's. It was right. a sporting, sporting complex at a pitch like Wembley and So we went there to prepare for the playoff final against Reading as a player. <laughs> so, Boy, sorry, sorry for interrupting you, mate. Grado's no here. But he met you on one of your pre-season trips. Right. So he did. So he did. Aye, right. and Aye. You, all, you were all flinging him into the swimming pool and all that. Oh, man, he's not even here to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll come back on. Get him. I'll come back on. I'll come back on. They probably will. Again, probably wouldn't with them. To me, how good is that? But that's the kind of atmosphere we always try to create. Everybody yeah. felt part of it. And the other thing as well, that if somebody did come up to introduce themselves, I didn't want players that felt they were aloof. I wanted people to see people are all, see it when people are always friendly and respectful. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't harm you to stand there for 15, 20 minutes to take photos or have a chat or whatever. You know, good, good manners cost nothing. I, I understand if you think, oh, somebody's at it and you know, they've been nasty. That's a different thing. But if somebody's pleasant and respectful, then I don't think there's... And I've always tried to encourage the players and the teams I've had to make sure we do that. So that doesn't surprise me that we, with the thrill and the thrill and everything else. <laughs> <laughs> uh, by the way, that was when you were at Motherwell. It wasn't it when you were managing at Bolton? Oh, right? like, <laughs> my, my 25 year old Grado getting fired into the pool. <laughs> <laughs> you can tell because I actually think I remember that now. So what happened was, it was actually, and it's probably kind of, if you think about it as wrestling, he was trying one of his moves on us who don't even wrestle. I think one of us just threw him on his shoulder. <laughs> <laughs> I'll make, we'll make a girl and get the forties when he's got forties of you and Brian Martin and all of them playing oh, him in the pool. Oh, brilliant! <laughs> and that, on that big Brian Martin, that brings me back. Here's a quick one. We were doing it. Big Alan McLeish was the manager, and I'll come back to the the Valdo Lobo in a minute. But Big Alan McLeish was the manager. We're preparing. We were trying to get back to team bonding, so we're doing the lads and uh, so it's it right, boys. We trained in the afternoon. Right, have a night out, have a few beers, enjoy yourself. Let's get in it together. So we're in and we're, we're uh, myself, Tommy Coy. Brian Martin, Chris McCart, Billy Davis, we all good senior pros, we good young boys, uh, Steve McMillan, uh, big leader colour, great group there. And uh, so anyway, we're playing, playing me games, so we're playing, uh, <laughs> so we're playing the read daft, they were playing the drinking games and what have you and everything else. And uh, so we did, we're playing, you know, the one with the teaspoons, the uh, teaspoon each, and you've got to hit the guy in the head. Aye. But Aye. Again, the, guy, the other guy's whacking you with a ladle. I was a referee now, and we the big centre half. You remember him, big, uh, big boy Greg Denham. Oh, aye. aye, aye. Big Greg, so big Greg, big Greg was uh, loved the Rangers and that big Greg as well, right? So we had a, a big match, Celtic boys, Rangers boys, great matter. But anyway, so I said to Tommy Coy, um, obviously I don't drink, I'm sober, I judge. Tommy wasn't drunk either. But Greg, young Greg's been a since he was three or four. So I said, uh, Hey, what about what about the spoons? Tommy, you're the champion. So big Greg Dale's well, who's the champion? He says, Tommy Coyne, he's the champion of the spoons. And I'm what's the spoons? I said, Well, does they put a new play and you don't know? No, no, I'll challenge him because it's Tommy Coy, right? So Tom says, hey, I'll take him on, no problem. So the rest of the boys are in and that. So anyway, Tom's got the teaspoon, and Greg bends his head over. So Tommy goes, Can't get any putches on, it's like a fenner. But I'm obviously the side of the big metal widow. <laughs> Fuck you. Man, Greg Dale's like, no, he goes, oh, so Greg Denham, Tommy Ben, Greg Denham goes to hit Tommy the teeth when he hits him. And all the boys are in the same going, like, whoa, as if he's whacking him. And Tom's like, oh, fuck it, you'll get this. He's like, ah, oh, you go, Tommy boy, that's for the jazz and all that. So, yeah. <laughs> so we do it, we do it three times. And I've, I suppose my judge, I've laid on him. Must have done a lot of the tap of his head. So uh, anyway, I says, right, boys, who's the winner? The boys are like, oh, Tommy's the winner. So Craig, he's, he's obviously got a few drinks here, and I'll be up. no, no, I'm not getting up. I want another one. He says, Craig, Craig, you've had enough. That's it, no more. No, no, another one. I said, Craig, you've had enough. He says, hey, no surrender. I said, oh, let's get another one there. Let's get another one there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he was brilliant. He loved it. 
back to the bracket when you mentioned Brian Martin. So big Brian Martin's well on a few beers. So Chris McCart, Chris, nicest guy in the world, Chris. So Chris has put a, a pound coin down. So he's just put it down the table. He's put a full pint of lager on the top of it. So he says to Brian Martin, Brian Martin, nickname was Buff. He says, Buff. He says, aye, what is it, Chris? He said, see that pint of lager? He says, aye. So he lifts it up. He says, look, pound coin underneath it. And he puts the pint of lager down. He says, I can lift that pound coin without you seeing me doing it. And Big Buff's going, who do you are, Paul Daniels and all that? He says, well, <laughs> he's he taking the bell on it, you know. He says, aye, okay, on you go then. Chris McCartney just went out with a pint of lager. Fuck you in Brian Martin's eyes. Brian Martin's like, pick the pound, pick the pound coin up and she's clapping. Anyway, which was, which was funny enough. So we're in the estate. Like Brian Martin couldn't see the funny side. Next minute, oh, bye. By the way, it was in the Keystone Tops. I've seen, I've seen big Brian Martin in action. He was going to do my mate a doing one night. So big Alex said, have a team bond and end up like a fight. I was like, they all take her out, just oh, boom, boom, oh, incredible. <laughs> anyway, back to Valdolobo. So, we're there, and we prepare, we prepare for the, uh, the playoff final. We come back and we win it. So, uh, when we got to the playoff final with Burnley, I had in my mind, oh, we did really well at Barrington, so I'll go and prepare, get the sun, it with. Uh, 12 days to prepare, get a bit of sun, the pitch is perfect, gets the boys bubbly, because we played 60 games, and the boys were spent, the boys were out on their feet, I needed to find a way to get the energy back. So we went there for five days, and again, you've seen how well we played in the playoff end. The reason I mention that is because, and Stevie and Gary will know this and everything else, and maybe it was the only place available, but if my memory says me right, Rangers didn't do well in the second half of last season when they came back to Dubai. So all, I'm, so all I'm saying on that, from my mind, psychologically, I'd have maybe thought, do you know what? I'm not going. I'm not going to Dubai. I'll go somewhere else. Just yeah. a psychological point of view for maybe it's players that were there or whatever. And, and I'm saying, I'm not saying it made a difference. Sometimes those little things do make a difference. I think it sticks, Nick, because even me and all my mates, we've had season tickets for as long as I can. I guarantee you just now, I'd be very surprised if Rangers go to Dubai next season, as you exactly. said. Exactly, because we were all sitting saying it when we because, after, because I think we, I think what I'm seeing it becomes a talking point. Aye, and, aye, and then, exactly. And even, and even subconsciously, you don't know how it affects you. Exactly, oh, aye, definitely. But what I would say is, they'll, get, they'll probably not be going to Dubai because we'll all still be in fucking lockdown for the next. <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully, hopefully that's lifted. Hopefully. How's it been treating you the old lockdown on? What's been happening? Well, I, I can back on the. I get me and Sandy, because Sandy's up in the, uh, Sandy's up in Rutherglen. Uh, oh. uh, we can back in the 16th, and then uh, lockdown was the 23rd, but I managed to get up and see all my brothers and sisters, because my, my mum had passed away last year, as you know, my mum had worked yeah, in, that I, she's worked in the Citizens Theatre for 50 years, so everybody knew I'm not a, uh, anyway, right. so there's nine of us, I've got five brothers and three sisters, so I managed to get up and see everybody, Kerry got to see her mum and dad and all the relatives, and then we came back down on Sunday evening, and lockdown was the Monday, so... Managed to get to see everyone who get back. I mean, we're quite lucky down here because I've got, got some gardens here. So, right. I mean, I, I despair for the people that, that don't have that space and weren't allowed to go. I mean, exactly, that's, exactly, mate. So I think that, that's a challenge, but I've been very lucky, very blessed in many ways. It's, Same, it's definitely, man. But it's what we do at the end of uh, football daft each week on is we give our guests a 90 second quiz. Right. Now, you've come, you've come across here as being exceptionally knowledgeable. I'm going to be honest with you. I has. Um, I, but last a couple of weeks ago, we had Kenny Duker on, and he's at the top of the list now. He gets 13 questions right in 90 seconds. Right. right? We've had in the past we've had Barry Ferguson. He's on 12. Looking down the rest of the board, it's a wee bit easy ozy after that. We get Brian Prunty and Alan Archibald on 11. Murdo McLeod on 10. Ian Murray and Lawrence Shankland on 7. Lee Miller, Jordan Young, Ross McCrory and Bob Malcolm all on six. Frank McAvenny and Dick Campbell are on five. Peter Lovenkranz is on three. And the strongest man in Scottish football is Cracks. Putting up the rest of the table with one. So, as long as you get more than hey, one, you're better than no, Cracks. No pressure there, but there's a few boys on that list. Well, you know, young Lord Shankman, Lawrence's dad and I grew up together in the Gorbals. Is that right? Yeah. So, before Lawrence, because I had like... I had lined Lawrence up to go to Air United the six months before he did with Ian McCall. 
But what happened was Jim Duffy came in at the last minute and took him to Morton. <coughs> so I'd, I'd gone really. I know young Lawrence, like when we go to holiday together, which you know, with Lawrence and his dad, as we do, uh, so they've I've, he's kind of grown up with us, so uh, there's no doubt he was going to be such a talented player. And he's he's a great man. Player, man. Uh, you, he's can, you can tread a wee bit of light then. I've been doing a wee bit of detective work on Lawrence, a Larry oh, boy, as I call him. Right now, last week he said, I was watching Umar Sadiq, and I'm just thinking to myself, God's sake, what are you doing? You're not doing it right. And I says, why would that annoy you if you were only a Rangers fan, right? <laughs> so, you've come in and you've went like that. I used to live in Little Donegal. And then you said, I grew up with Lawrence Shetland's dad. So I'm assuming he lived in Little Donegal and all. So maybe Lawrence or Larry Boy might be a selling supporter. I don't know what's going on here, man. Well, the easy, the easy answer to that one is no, no, no. <laughs> they, were, they, were, uh, they, were, uh, they went to the other school, shall we say, but uh, they were, we were all pals. And they were, the one thing we all loved, and this is the thing that should be, is football. Everybody loves football. And I think, I love that people support and the passion of their own teams. And obviously we understand everything that's growing up. And it's not just about, about football up the road, but hopefully that stuff can get eradicated and it should just be about football. Because the, the yeah, more yeah. we do that, the better. Then, then everybody, everybody gets on a lot better with each other, and that's it's the, best game in, it's the best game in the world. And that's why you know when that other stuff it spoils it. Let's just enjoy the football and, and let the best team on the on the, on the pitch that's win. That's what I was saying. I was I was on another podcast this week, and the guy was asking me. He says, "Oh, you had your own with the two Rangers fans." I says, "Listen, mate." I says, "It's football daft. I do football daft with my two mates. Right. They just have to be Rangers fans. Do you know what I mean? It's not." It was, a, it was a great way you put that across, mate. I listened to it and when you said that, it was good. It's like you're just sitting with your two mates talking about football. It's not a day, way. It's just... It's exactly. Just, it's it's exactly. I mean, we rub each other. We rub the life out of each other, don't we? But it's, see, it's funny games. See the amount of people that say to me, oh, how come, how come Sandy Stewart and you have all together? Your assistant, he's a big Rangers man. I said, he's my pal. That's, right. I'm trying exactly. to trust him in my life. He's a terrific coach. He knows the game where our players together. We played in that, that every team. And... Uh, that's what it's uh, about, mate. It, just, it baffles me, it really does, because I think myself, you know, you know, you know we're all off football, but leave it there, it's just football. Ah, it's see, when it gets, see when it starts to get personal and affecting your own life and all that, that's when you're just like, you know what I mean? Sick, see, that. see, before I forget, before your quiz, I don't know if, if I've told you a story, forgive me if I have, but my first job as a manager in my own right was manager St. Johnston. You know, I'd done the, right. me and Yogi done the thing together and won the, won the league at Falkirk. So I was help, I was actually helping Sandy. I was playing for Sandy at Edinburgh United. I had been on loan from Dundee United where I was player coach. And uh, anyway, Jeff Brown rung me and uh, you like you like this one. So when I went to Dundee United as player coach, uh, I I bought a lodge. It's the only lodge I've ever been in. And a lodge <laughs> <laughs> I, I, this is what I'm talking about that stuff. I had a lodge, I had a lodge up at Eric Eric Moore Estate, which is at Dunkeld, just outside Perth. So anyway, it was at Easter holidays. Anyway, Jeff Brown rang me and he said, oh, and he said, hey, would you be interested in St. Johnston manager's job? I said, oh, chairman, I've not applied for your job. He says, no, no, I know that, but you come well recommend. I've seen the job he did, obviously, at Falkirk uh, with Yogi. Your brother Thomas played for me. I know the family traits. I know your kind of values, your core values, your core principles. I'd love to have a chat with you about it. I said, oh, chairman, I'd love the opportunity. He says, right, I'll drive down to Glasgow to meet you. I said, no, no, you don't have to, actually. I'm actually in, in Dunkeld. I says, I've got a holiday lodge at uh, Burnham at Dunkeld. I says, we're up with the family for Easter. He says, right, I'll be out in 10 minutes from Perth to... So it was pouring the rain. So I've said to Kerry, well, I says, Kerry, you're going to have to take the kids out. She went, what? I says, it's a Johnson Chairman's company. He's wanting to talk to me about the job. She says, oh, it's pouring the rain. I says, I know that, but can you not take them out of Dunkeld or walk her? So anyway, she's got them already, the mats on, the buggies, and away in the room with me. So she's away in the pouring rain. Anyway, Je Jeff Brown turns up, sure enough, 10, 15 minutes later. I said, oh, come in, Chairman. So you come in, you come in the door there, then there's a, a wee kitchen area to your, over to your right hand side, and there's a seat in the living area through there. So I could take a seat, Chairman. So he goes through and sits down. So I'm in the, the kitchen, but I said, do you like a tea or a coffee? He says, oh, I'd love a coffee. So I'm like, oh, fuck's sake, I'm going to drink tea. So I drink tea. <laughs> so I'm, saying, I'm trying to make a good impression. Yes, Mr. Chairman. No, Mr. Chairman. So I'm looking for this coffee. Anyway, I've actually found the coffee. So I made it, and because I only drink tea, my mugs are about that size, huge big mugs of tea I drink. So two sugar milk, I take sugar milk for him. Away we go. Chatted easily for about 70 minutes. Couldn't have went any better on the chat, the football, back and forth. Dead relaxed. The way we are now, nothing, it was dead free flow, and everybody had a bit to say. Couldn't have went any better. So he said, listen on, I've loved the chat. I'll be in touch sooner or later. 
I said, thanks, Chairman. I've got to say I enjoyed that. He went, no, it was great, son. Thank you very much. So I see him out. So I went and grabbed my mobile phone. It's on silent, obviously. 12 missed calls to Kerry. Obviously, went back in with the end. So I phoned myself. <laughs> She was like, you finished now? I says, aye, come in. Aye, I won't come in, don't you worry. So she's in the corner. And it's been that much rain, you know, when you've come in the wet and it's still running down your nose and all that. So it's trickling down. The, the kids are soaked through. So she says, that better be worth it. I says, Kerry, it couldn't have went any better. I said, the only thing was he threw me at the start. She says, asked for a coffee. Could I find a coffee? I said, I eventually found it anyway with it. She went, like, we've not got coffee. I says, I have. She went, that's Bisto gravy. You know? <laughs> So I picked the phone up and I phoned her, I says, Chairman, she's I says, I've got an apology, mate. She says, What's that? I says, it turns out I was a coffee, mate, it was Bristol Gravy. She says, I thought it was a funny wee tang off it. <laughs> any, 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 anyway, Owen, your 90 seconds are up. Oh, there we go. <laughs> 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 That was brilliant. I, I'm all I'm got a bisto. Oh, honestly. Nice. Yeah. He gave me the oh, job, so it must be worth it. Brilliant. Nice <laughs> <laughs> question. Right. Uh, what, just what a job you done with St. Johnson and all, man. He did. Oh, all. I love it. Well, great people. I mean, they're great. And that's the thing. We've seen football because I, I mean, with you is when you do your stuff. I'm everything but be positive with the game, positive with people. But you get a lot of people just want to kind of dwell on the negativity. In football, you'll always go to ups and downs. You have them as a player, you have them as a manager. The important thing is that if it does, and it's the same way, you pick yourself up the next day and you go again, as difficult as it is. Aye. Because you do one or two things. Yeah, you got up, prepared to do something about it, but you feel sorry for yourself, and that's not going to help anybody. No, definitely. Right, man. Super. Who's hey, asking the questions? Get questions for you, I think it's your turn this week, mate. Right, mate. Okie doke. 90 seconds. You ready, on? Right, I'm doing football. <laughs> All football. You can't pass. You need to give an answer. All okay? right. Right, even if you're wrong, just give an answer. Aye. 90 seconds on the clock, John. Yep. Here we go. What English club are nicknamed the Porters? Oh, Stoke City. What town are East Fife from? Five. And what year did you sign for Dunfermline? 2001. Rangers have just signed Yanis Hadji from which club? Genk. What is the current name of Ross County's ground? The Globe Arena. Who were awarded the Junior West Premiership League this year despite being 12 points from the top? Okay, right. Who did you replace when you made your debut for Ireland? Tony Coyne. What American club does Ronnie Dyler now manage? New York City. What is the name of Stenhouse Muir's home ground? Oakview. Who preceded Alex McLeish as Scotland manager in his first spell? His first spell? Oh, Alec. They actually helped to get me the job at Burnley, big Alec. Oh, Alan Walkersmith. At what club did you score your most goals? Oh, Airdy. Who finished second bottom of the Scottish? Premiership. Hello. Which Scottish club have a hand of blessing on their badge? Hearts. Paul Lambert won the European Cup with what team? British and Northern. In what year were Burnley formed? Time! Oh. I, think, I, think you're being, I think you gave Owen about 120 seconds because he's, cause he's your hero, John. Come on, come on. <laughs> <laughs> hold on, hold on, because I did ask that question. Right, okay, I'll wait you and answer that last question. Right. In what year were Burnley formed? Right. Have I got time, mate? Because I need to work it back. I'll tell you why. Seeing I took the job, that's a story. Forgive me. <laughs> <laughs> seeing, I took the, seeing, I, seeing I took the job in 2007, that was my first home game was against Stoke City. Right. And we wore, we wore our, like, an Argentina strip. Because it was Burnley's 125th anniversary. Right. So I take, so I take, take 125 off 2007. We're at. Uh... <laughs> Is that eight? Oh, hold on. <laughs> 2007. So there's 107. Uh, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18. 
What an effort, what an what effort. effort right? Anki's Ank Ank pushing the good doctor a wee bit here. Well, we'll find out. Here we go. Um, we'll go through the wrong answers. Uh, <laughs> Owen, uh, East Pfeiffer from Methyl. Um, Methyl, I know, I've just... You signed for Dunfermline in 1999, not two I think you played till 2001. Actually, I left in 2001, I thought that's what you said. When did you leave? Oh, right. No, no, it was when you played. Oh, okay. oh, it must be the wine. Ah, right. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you said, when did you leave? Um, you got the, 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 the club with the blessing on their badge was Kilmarnock. Tomorrow, and we got to 1882 eventually. Well, we'll let you off for that one. We'll let you off for that. Answer. Aside from that, you got everything right. So I've got you down for 12. Oh. I've gone down for 11. Oh, oh yeah, I have tw- I know, 12, Chris. 12, definitely. Oh, it should be 12. By the last question, sorry. The other one was misheard. <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, that's surprising given the size of my ears. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> So second joint, second joint top with Barry Ferguson. You and Barry Ferguson are on 12, just one behind Kenny Duke up. Nice, nice. Do you know where Kenny played for me? Didn't he? He played for me at St Johnston. St Johnston, aye. He really did that, that's right, aye. He really did that, he spoke about it. He aye. loved his time at St Johnston, didn't he? Aye, the flat and big guy, man. Great, 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 Honestly, it's Thank been great to you, bud. Absolutely. By the way, these guys are getting better by the week. It's well, class. I'm not saying, you probably know it, I'm not saying I'm not competitive, but give it a couple of months, I'm coming back and back on for that question. <laughs> 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 All the best, on. Take Thank care, you so much. I hope once this Clifton boys are up the road, they'll see you. I look forward to it. Brilliant. Bye. Take care. Brilliant. Take care. Thank, Thank you. you. Right, Cole, that was another good show. Great old Grace is we presents for. But a wee bit, didn't he? He was in and out. He's got a good reason, hasn't he? He's got a good reason. So. A good reason. But he nearly missed a funeral from Cherry right. Polini, so let's, Plus, let's be honest, that's, that's done, commitment. <laughs> we, aye, we done the interview with Owen Coyle. Aye. With Cherry Polini on for Grado. In amongst Grado's cameo appearance, he even managed to have a shave. I know. <laughs> By the way, see for anybody that's no notice, right? We filmed the own coil and I'll do it yesterday, right? So that's why I'm wearing different clothes. But Stevie, the professional I am, John, he's went, he's went for continuity. He's put he's, he's put the same clothes on for yesterday. Yeah. Grado hasn't even got the same beard that he had when he started the fucking interview, <laughs> and he wasn't even on it yesterday. He done it in the one day. No, I mean, that's just that's what you're up against for this game. <laughs> it is football daft, and it? It's daft, it is. But oh. honestly, Owen Coyle, what a guest. That was a great show, man. Honestly, it was brilliant. Do you know what? I keep saying this, and I feel as if I'm saying it every week, but genuinely, Owen Coyle is my favourite guest that we've had on so Aye. far. He was class. And he done well on the quiz and all, didn't he? Not he bad, up there, 13. Come on, was he four half, man? 12. Producer John had a bit of a beamer when he was talking to him, didn't he? Oh, love him, love him. Aye, well, you say, you say beamer, I say <laughs> <laughs> Right, troops, rate, review, subscribe, all that jazz. Get us on all social media platforms, blah, blah, blah. I've been Stephen Purden. I've been Chris Toll. I've been Producer Don. Let's roll the credits. <laughs> oh no no wait a minute wait a minute Oh no I've got to tell you about my big brother story Oh we've not got time for the big brother oh, story Wait next week Wait next week mate Right remind me next week right Right, right. right. All the credits Give us right. <laughs> <laughs> Right 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 Right